Okay, so Chauncey's um, explained how to uh, compute vibration modes and compute vibrations, and that's the, the, the core part of, uh, of what we need to do for modal sound. Um, so this next part we're going to go on and talk about acoustic transfer. So acoustic transfer basically uh, describes how the sound, these vibrations produce sound waves in, in space and it involves the wave equation. So we're going to talk about the core idea of acoustic transfer, and then we're going to talk about wave equation, acoustic waves, and then acoustic waves in the frequency domain, how we get to that case, and then what the, what the problems we need to solve are to get the radiation that we actually want to render in, 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 in practice. Uh, along the way, I'm going to talk about multipole sound sources, which are really, really useful. They're super fast to evaluate, and they're the workhorses of a lot of solvers. And then I'm going to talk about different solvers and representations because we don't just need to solve things and, you know, make a graph. We need to evaluate them rapidly in real time for a lot of applications. So there's a bunch of different things I'll talk about until I run out of time. Um, okay, so acoustic transfer basics. So the, the key idea at this point is we have a model for linear modal sound. So using some software library that we'll talk about, you can take a model in, mesh it, compute the modes, and get the frequencies. And you can apply an impulse to it, give it a force, and it'll start vibrating. So that's the core thing you get right now. And one, one model of the sound is just add together all those individual little vibrations of each of those modal oscillators and, and use that as a sound. It'll sound like something, but it won't be predictive of true sound because it doesn't know anything about the air around it. So in practice, what we want is we want to multiply uh, or uh, each of these independent modal oscillations by some amplitude function or some more general uh, transfer function. So the simplest thing we can do is just scale the amplitude, and this already can account for the dramatic variations in amplitude of each of these modes. So in practice, the acoustic transfer function, we can think of it as just a function of space, of the position of your ear, X, in the object's frame of reference, and that's going to modulate each of the individual modes. And we do this for each of the modes and add them together by linear superposition of the, of the wave equation. Okay, so basically the transfer function just tells you how loud each mode is. You're going to compute one for each of the modes. And so basically the sound is a sum of each of these uh, transfer functions, which are functions of space multiplying the mode amplitude Q, which is a function of time. In practice, you don't need to evaluate the transfer functions at audio rates. You can do this at a few hundred hertz or depending on how fast your ear is moving in the object's frame of reference. You can do this at a couple hundred hertz and then just smoothly interpolate the transfer values, the amplitudes along the trajectory. And this works, this works well in practice. So often, I should point out that people usually just use a 1 over R fall off for sound models in virtual environments. And this is really simple, and it's widely done. Uh, you basically take all the amplitudes of these modal oscillators, Q, uh, those little sound waves, and add them together and divide by R. And this is common, but it's also not physically, physically correct. Um, sound sources don't behave like point sources in general, and especially when there's... Uh, you know, for ordinary objects on human scales, there's significant diffraction effects that lead to pressure fields around the object which have very pronounced uh, ray-like structures at higher frequencies. And so it's fundamentally just not, they're not one over our fall-offs. Uh, there's, there's more spatial structure. In certain cases, you can use a model like this, uh, but it basically is, is technically only correct if your object is very far away and the wavelengths of the sound associated with the sound source are, are much longer than the, the length scale of the object. So the object is very tiny compared to them, and the object is closed. In, in these cases, you can produce one of these 1 over R monopole sources, but that's a, a lot of special cases. Um, and the main reason is because diffraction effects are, are very important for the interference uh, uh, of, of these waves trying to figure out how they produce these, these particular modal velocities on the surface. So the key thing is we, we have basically three orders of magnitude in frequency and three orders of magnitude in wavelength that we're interested in. So th for the range of frequencies, 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, you're looking at wavelengths that vary from 20 meters down to 20 millimeters. Okay, so that's a huge range of scales. Uh, and at the, when we get down to the smaller scales, it becomes much harder to solve these problems in practice. 
Um, so our problem is a little bit easier than architectural acoustics, where you have huge domains filled by these wavelengths. We're looking at sound sources, which are smaller, but it's still a challenging problem. Just to show you some of the effect of a point source versus a non-point source, here's this example from a, an older paper. Um, on the left is the acoustic transfer renderer, which has directionality effects. On the right is just a 1 over R effect. Okay, so I'm definitely going to need the sound turned on for this part. This is, uh, this is the analog audio. Any sound? Sound. So including the wave equation effects will give us stronger directionality, but it also is going to fundamentally change the loudness of different modes uh, that you're not going to get if you just ignore it. Okay, so let's look at acoustic waves in a little more detail. Um, I encourage you to look at like a fluid reference like Robert Bridson's Fluid Course Notes or another acoustics book for derivation of the wave equation. Basically, it comes from three parts. One is mass conservation, that, that basically all the mass is conserved. Uh, w when these fluctuations occur. And the other is the momentum equation, or F equals MA. So basically the density of the fluid times the acceleration is equal to the, the force density, which in this case is due to the acoustic pressure. So P is basically the fluctuation in the pressure about some background amplitude, say the average atmospheric pressure. So we're interested in these small fluctuations in pressure and small fluctuations in particle velocity as they oscillate and small fluctuations in density. Uh, in this case, this is the total density. And, and the last part that you need to derive the wave equation is basically a gas law, how pressure and density are related. Uh, and this comes out of this equation, the energy equation at constant entropy. And basically the proportionality constant that shows up is basically the speed of sound squared C. And so these three things can be combined to cancel the velocity term and to cancel the density term. Uh, rho delta. This is the small acoustic density fluctuation. If these are combined, you can get something just in terms of the pressure. And so this is the familiar wave equation. It basically says uh, that the, the second derivative, spatial derivative of the, dense, of the pressure is related to the second derivative of, of time. Uh, and here, uh, this is the Laplacian, which is basically a generalized second derivative in space. Um, so this is the equation that we, that we want to solve ideally. Just in 1D, if we just look at the, the 1D equation where this is the second spatial derivative, it basically says the acceleration of, of, of pressure is proportional to the, the curvature of pressure in space. And so it's gonna, if it's curving upwards, it's going to be accelerated up. If it's curving down, it's going to be accelerated down. And these are, these are the, t the equation that we're interested in. So the higher the speed, the faster the, the change. Okay. Um, so in order to actually produce sound from these vibrating solids, we need to have a boundary condition. And the boundary condition we're always going to use for radiation is a derivative boundary condition. And it comes out of the momentum equation. We need to know how, how accelerations of the boundary are going to produce forces on the fluid. And that comes from this equation. And we only need the normal component of this. So if we take the normal component of pressure, the gradient, we get this pressure, the change of pressure in the normal direction is equal to uh, the normal component of this acceleration term, which gives us this. So this is basically the, the pressure gradient is equal to the negative density of the fluid times the normal acceleration of the solid. And this is the thing that comes from the modal vibration. So this is how the wave equation is driven by the vibrations. Um, the other condition we need is a radiation condition at infinity, which basically uh, boils down to saying that the waves have to be going outwards at infinity and decaying. And this avoids our non-physical solutions such as infinite sources at infinity that produce uh, the boundary conditions on the object. This is the Sommerfeld radiation condition. Okay, so for modal sound, what we see is that the frequencies of individual modal oscillations are strongly localized at the modal, modal frequency. So if we take a histogram, uh, so this is a symbol modeled using linear modal analysis. If we, if we hit it and look at the vibrations of each of the modes, what we see is that the frequency content of each of those modes is very localized around that modal frequency. No, no big surprise. 
And so what that means is that we really can model the radiation of individual modes using just the wave equation at that frequency. And this turns out to be a, a good approximation to the amplitude of, of these modes. Uh, short time transients aren't modeled, but that's, uh, it's, it's a good approximation otherwise. Okay, so what we're gonna do throughout is use complex numbers to represent uh, the oscillations. And so this is a standard in acoustics, but let me just, just review this very briefly. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna represent a unit amplitude uh, temporal vibration, uh, the time dependent part of, of, of some vibration as a complex number, e to the i omega t. And we use a plus here, sometimes people use minuses. You have to make sure you get the right one, otherwise your equations aren't right. Um, so in this case, we can just have this representation where it's a cosine and an imaginary sine part. If we want a slightly different phase, if we want to shift it in time, we can add, we can multiply by this uh, imaginary, uh, this complex value part, e to the i phi, and that's going to add a shift here. So we can always just reason about one cosine and know that we can shift it to another uh, sine or cosine or some other phase just by multiplying. And so we can think of our oscillation as a complex valued number and where we're only interested in, say, the real part of this, which could be some cosine part. Uh, we're also going to think of the time-dependent variation of this function, the pressure function, as just having some uh, harmonic part here, e to the i omega t. And this, you can think of this as just some spatial field p of x, some pressure, complex pressure field, which is just oscillating uh, due to this uh, harmonic part. And so this allows us to get rid of the time dependence here by the separation of variables to get just a pure complex value pressure field. And so this thing here is gonna be the acoustic transfer function. It doesn't change in time. It's just a complex valued field defined everywhere in space. And the amplitude of the modulus of that complex number at any point tells us how loud the pressure is there. It basically tells us you know, how loud this, say a unit vibration is uh, at any point in space. Um, so if we write this out, then we can see that we basically have the amplitude of the acoustic transfer function tells us how loud it is. And the other thing here is just a unit amplitude uh, complex number. Okay, so if we take this, this harmonic uh, form and substitute it in the wave equation, uh, then we can simplify things. We can take the time derivative and that's just gonna pull down an uh, uh, omega squared part. And and we're gonna be, be able to factor it in this form. So this first part has to be zero because this other part here is never zero. This is always unit modulus. So that means that we end up with this wave equation or the Helmholtz equation, which is independent of time and only governs the spatial part of the transfer function, uh, which is the part that we want to know the amplitude of the sound. And here K is the wave number related to two pi over the, the wavelength of the sound. So it's basically a frequency-like number. So for low frequencies, this is just, a Helmholtz, this, just the Laplace equation as K goes to zero. But at higher frequencies, it becomes a much more challenging wave-like problem to solve. Okay, so we're almost there. We have the Helmholtz equation, but what about our boundary condition? We know that the, the gradient of the pressure is driven by the acceleration of the modes, but what about in the frequency domain? What is the equivalent boundary condition? And what is the acceleration in the frequency domain? So what we can do is we can take our, our modal oscillation that Chauncey derived. It's just some, for any individual mode, okay? It's just gonna be a spatial mode part on the surface of the object times something varying at the, harm, the modal frequency omega that comes out of the eigensolver. So this is gonna be the, the harmonic time-like part. And if we take the normal part of this, because we only need the normal component, then we just get something like this, a scalar complex equation. Uh, similarly, we can take a time derivative of, of each of these on the left and right and get the velocity. And then similarly, we can take another derivative and get the, the acceleration. And the normal part of this acceleration looks like this. So in the end, we have the normal acceleration is got some harmonic variation, and now it's just our modal, it's the normal component of the mode on the object at some point, times omega squared minus omega squared, okay? And so it basically tells us that the acceleration is just omega squared basically times the, the modal uh, displacement. And so this allows us to have the same equation in the frequency domain. Um, so when we put this together, now on the left we have the time, the the pressure derivative, 
which has harmonic variation. On the right, we have the acceleration, which has harmonic variation. These are never zero, so we can just divide by them and cancel them. And we end up with the frequency domain boundary condition. This says that the, the normal gradient of the acoustic transfer function on the boundary of the object has to be equal to this scaling factor times the normal component of the modal, modal displacement, which we can compute. So this is a, a real valued equation except for, except for this p function. And so that's, that's what we need. So the acoustic transfer boundary value problem is the following. So we're given, we do the, we do the vibration analysis from the modal analysis. We get the mode data. We look at the normal component everywhere. And we know the frequency of that mode on the geometry. And so what we want to do is solve the outgoing radiation problem in the exterior outside the object by solving this, this problem in the infinite domain outside the object, subject to this normal boundary condition and then some other conditions that the waves are decaying and going out, away from the object. So this is the key problem we have to solve. But the domain is infinite. We can't just mesh the domain and solve it everywhere. So we need some, some good tools to do this. We'll talk about those in a moment. So to visualize the solutions, we can always just multiply by this and look at the real part or the imaginary part and see the waves. Or we can, and we can animate them with this. Or we can just look at their amplitudes. So here are some waves outside an object. Uh, at lower frequencies, they're very blurry, OK? Because the wavelengths are long. And the object is being, the, the modal vibrations are being smeared out by these long wavelength waves. But as we go to higher frequencies, then you start to see more pronounced ray-like structure. You have more pronounced angular variations. And you end up with harder problems to solve. And they take longer in general to, to evaluate, uh, unless you do something special. Um, and so in this case here, this is the, the wave equation. This is basically p of x times e to the i omega t. And just looking at the real part of that, it's going to change in time with the cosine variation. And then these are the outgoing waves. So this is the thing that we, we want to evaluate for each mode to get the amplitude of, the, of the, modal, uh, the modal vibration at your ear position. So all of these were represented using multipole sound sources. So these are singular solutions of the Helmholtz equation. They satisfy this everywhere except at where, they're, where the source is located, where it's singular. Okay, like a 1 over R source is a typical example that people are familiar with for, for Laplace. Um, and so they include things like a monopole, where you have a point source, radiant, or a dipole, which is a directional source, quadrupoles in all higher orders. Um, the simplest one is a mon monopole. It looks like 1 over R source, but it has a cosine, sine, and cosine part here, the complex valued component. And uh, here, this is the wave number. And then we have the distance from the source. The key thing is that this behaves like a point source with a, a, a little uh, divergence pressure component at the location that the source is located. Um, and so this thing represents an outgoing wave, because when you multiply by e to the plus i omega t, you get something like this. And if you look at the, the, the argument here of this exponential, then if you look at a constant constant phase, then this corresponds to a radius of, the, of a spherical wave that is increasing at the speed of sound, c, an outward direction. So this is an outgoing wave. If you had minus here, then you would, have, you would need to have pluses on your kr terms. OK, so in general, we can represent all of the spherical multipole sources uh, as products of two parts. One is a, a radial part here. And this thing is a spherical Henkel function of the second kind. This is, it sounds scary, but it's actually a good Henkel function to have. They're easier to deal with. They're just sines and cosines and powers of 1 over r. And then this one is the spherical harmonic, which is familiar from a lot of graphics applications in, in physics. So these are functions that there's code for, and you can evaluate. Um, they sound worse than they are. Um, just in, just to, to break it down, the spherical Henkel function of the second kind corresponds to outgoing waves. Uh, the first kind is incoming waves, in this case. Um, but they're, they're actually just all sines and cosines divided by different powers of r. Here's some, some of them. But you can get them all using very simple recurrence relations. If you just know the first couple, you can derive all of them with this very simple formula. And you can get derivatives easy, too, for, for, for the boundary conditions. So these things are, are things that you can evaluate easily. Just, just feel reassured that they're not, they're not, they're not bad. And there's formulas to get the spherical harmonics as well, and lots of code to evaluate them. They're very common, so I'm not going to go into that in more detail. So we can evaluate, we can represent a whole wave field for a, a vibration at a single frequency using a multipole expansion at a single point. 
And then this allows us to uh, figure out some coefficients for this expansion. And then we just multiply by these individual multipole basis functions to get uh, uh, the wave field represented here. Okay? So in general, you can just think of this as a, a linear combination of some basis functions, okay, which are of some, some particular type like this. And they're weighted by some complex coefficient. So at the end of the day, you can represent the whole wave field from, from say, this, your object at some frequency just by a vector of complex coefficients. And you can put it in some code. It'll just evaluate these expansions and it'll give you the pressure amplitude at your listening position. So it's, it's a very compact and efficient way to evaluate this. Um, so in order to, to get these representations, we have to solve something, though. Um, and we need to do this quickly because basically for every mode, uh, every time sample, and every object, we have to evaluate these transfer functions. So this needs to be cheap. Uh, so it's not about just solving the wave equation. We have to represent the solutions efficiently. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, which I, I don't have time to go into detail. So there's spatial discretizations with standard methods for, getting, uh, get, for solving the wave equation for the Helmholtz equation. And then the workhorse in all computational acoustics and engineering is a boundary element method for acoustics. It's very effective. Uh, if you have big problems, you need fast solvers. And then another method which I, I really like is because of its simplicity is the equivalent source method, which we'll talk about in just a moment. In general, all of these problems struggle at higher and higher frequencies because you have smaller wavelengths. It makes the interference problems harder to solve. The method that Chauncey's going to talk about next for, for, for the modal sound pipeline is just to use a boundary element method, uh, Helmholtz solver. And the basic idea is that you know the geometry and you have the mode and the frequency, and then you can evaluate the derivative of the pressure boundary condition, which is related to just the mode. So you basically discretize the boundary into triangles or some elements, and then using the boundary element method, you can figure out the unknown pressure on the boundary, the key unknown quantity, from the derivative uh, of the pressure and solve for this by solving a dense linear system or some using a more sophisticated solver. Uh, so the end result is you, you pass in the derivative of the pressure and you get out the pressure. And then once you know the pressure and the gradient of the pressure on the boundary, then you can evaluate the pressure anywhere using an integral. So there's a beautiful theorem called that says that the Kirchhoff integral, as stated here, where g is some 1 over r type function and its gradient is here. And this is the derivative data that you just you have from the mode. And this is the pressure that you just solve for from boundary element method, OK? So once you have pressure and gradient everywhere on the boundary, anywhere outside the object, you can just do this integral and get the pressure that, that's associated with this sound. Um, so if you have n triangles and you have m modes, it's going to cost you order m n work to do all these integrals. So in general, this is really slow because you've got to do this at hundreds of times a second. So this is not great. Uh, but this is, this is a, a standard workhorse for a lot of methods. Um, now, you've, this is an awful slide, but it's, it's basically what I say is that there's a closed form expression to get all of the multipole expansion coefficients. So if I have a, a, a solid, I've solved the boundary element method. I got pressure and its gradient. Now I can evaluate all of the multipole coefficients using this closed form expression, where R are some standard functions that you can look up in books or get standard code for. And so the key idea is that once you solve the boundary element uh, problem, you can evaluate the coefficients. And then all of the transfer function becomes just a vector of complex value coefficients. You store. Uh, you compute and store once. And the key thing is that for a very small number of coefficients, you can evaluate all of, all of the field from this. And this is much, much cheaper than doing a full integral because it's independent of the geometric complexity of the object, which is key. Okay? Another way to, to actually solve the problem is, is to use the equivalent source method. Um, so this avoids doing a, a boundary element solve or any discretization. It basically says that I know I, I have the wave equation satisfied outside the object, and I know I have a boundary condition. So what can I do? I can put a whole bunch of sources inside the object, assuming it's a closed volumetric object. And all the, if, if these are multipole sources, I'm guaranteed that they'll satisfy the wave equation, the Helmholtz equation. The only thing they don't do is satisfy the boundary condition. So there's a bunch of different methods for finding these coefficients such that they satisfy the boundary conditions better. Okay? 
And the basic idea is this. The pressure is, the acoustic transfer pressure is given by a linear combination of some, some basis functions which satisfy the Helmholtz equation, okay? Uh, and then all I need to do is tune these coefficients such that the boundary condition error is minimized, okay? And so you, you have the boundary condition and you substitute this expression into it and then you get a linear system that all the coefficients have to satisfy. And this is, must be true at every point on the boundary. So what you can do is discretize your boundary and then apply this condition at every point. Every point gives you another linear constraint on your coefficient vector. And if you put them all together, it's a big linear system. And you can solve this linear system to find, using the least squares method to find a, the coefficients of each of these sources such that when they all radiate, they all add up at the boundary to produce the right derivative pressure boundary condition. It's a really cool method because it, it's, it basically, you can have a very small number of coefficients and then just go ahead and directly solve for them using the least squares technique. So it's, it's the kind of thing that you can like literally code up a solver in an afternoon and it's, it's, it's really, it's works, it works well. Um, so this was a technique that was adapted into a method called pre-computed acoustics transfer, which is a, a fairly complicated method I don't have time to talk about today at two, SIGGRAPH 2006, where you basically first took the modal model and a boundary element solver and evaluated the pressure on an offset surface. If you have a thin shell or a thin object, you can't place singular sources inside it because there's no room inside it, right? So what we did was we built an offset surface and evaluated pressure there and then optimized the placement and the coefficients of each of these sources to match the boundary data on this, on this offset surface. And then once you had that, you have a small number of sources which you can rapidly evaluate to get the pressure at runtime. And this worked and it was real time in 2006. In 2006, it only took about a, a third of a microsecond per dipole. It's a lot cheaper now. And using only tens of sources, you could approximate uh, the, the radiation fields of, of each of these modes uh, to within perceptual, perceptual values. Okay. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is how to do this really, really, really cheap. So let's exploit a speed uh, memory trade-off. We can evaluate all of these transfer functions in constant time at less than a, a microsecond per mode if you bake everything into texture maps. Okay, we don't want to store the whole field because it's infinite and three-dimensional. That's too much space. So what we can do is put them into sort of basically sphere maps of, of, of the outgoing radiation. And this allows us to do things really, really quickly. So if you look at the transfer functions in space, as you get to higher frequencies where all the trouble is and all the data is, um, they start to have stronger uh, angular structure. And, but they still are very radial functions that are kind of boring in the radial direction. So what we're going to do is we're going to exploit a theorem that says you can always do a 1 over r expansion of the pressure field, where the coefficient of each 1 over r term is a, a, a theta phi uh, angular texture map. Okay? And so basically what this says is that we have 1 over r expansion, and we're going to store the outgoing radiation uh, textures uh, in the theta phi space. And if you pre-compute those things with a very low order expansion of just like even one or two terms, you can do a pretty good job. So we call these far field acoustic transfer maps or FAT maps. And, uh, and with a very low number of terms, like one texture per mode, you can store and evaluate the pressure to a reasonable value. Um, so this was like 75 microseconds to evaluate 100 modes. So this is really, really fast. And there's a, a method to pre-compute these by tabulating the pressure on spherical shells and doing least squares solves for each one of the pixels to get the texture values. Um, and so you can get these beautiful, super high resolution transfer maps uh, of very detailed fields, uh, which can be pre-computed using uh, fancy solvers like the fast multipole method or other methods ahead of time. And then you can bake all of this angular structure into texture maps and you can get really close to the objects and hear all the variations. So in practice, you can compute far more information than you, you can hear. So you also want to control the resolution and detail so that you don't store and compute more than you need at runtime. Um, this is really heavy on the, on the memory storage side. So you're looking at hundreds of megabytes for the sound field for one of these objects. Um, so if you want something that's more performant, if you want to pack it into like, you know, tens of K or something, then you want to go with a really low order multipole expansion. 
In practice, that will do badly at high frequencies, because when you get to higher frequencies, there's more detail and structure, but you also can't hear that as well. Um, so there, you have to exploit the fact that your perception uh, degrades your sensitivity to the higher frequencies. Okay. Um, but in practice, uh, you can do a, a good job of approximating the input mode with the approximation, uh, even with a, a low order expansion. Um, there's some detail for later. Here's a comparison of like a boundary element solve that was used to evaluate this render in 13 hours using direct evaluation versus the fat map approximation, which is in real time. So this is, you can't tell the difference. And so you can allow more error in practice uh, by having fewer textures or less resolution. The last thing I want to say about acoustic transfer is that it's really important for capturing the, the widely varying uh, ability of modes to produce sound. If you ignore them and just use a constant amplitude factor, you're not going to capture the natural, the natural character of, of sound sources. So there's a concept called radiation efficiency, which is just like, it says how good is a mode at making sound. Uh, it's basically useful if you think of a loudspeaker. If I have a tiny speaker cone and I want to, you know, play a really strong drum and bass track over it, it's going to be awful, right? Because a tiny speaker will not produce low frequencies that, that have long wavelengths very well. So it's inefficient at producing low frequencies, but it would be more efficient at producing high frequencies. And this is the concept of radiation efficiency. It says the power radiated divided by the, the amount of energy of the vibrating surface, that ratio... Uh, is the efficiency of, the, of this vibrating surface to produce sound. And, and for different objects, it varies dramatically and non-monotonically. So here's a, a, a thin shell model of a dragon. And what you can see is the radiation efficiency values uh, normalized, um, drawn for all of the modes. And in this case, you have some which are, you know, 100 times or 1,000 times less than others. And this is significant. You can hear this. If you don't include it, uh, you'll get the wrong sound. It's not predictive. Okay. All right, so we're still on track. It's still 2 p.m., after 2 p.m. Thank you for noticing that. And uh, so at this point, we're going to go on to how to implement rigid body sound. And then we're going to take a short break after that, and we're going to talk about some of the more advanced animation topics. Um, I guess I also need sound. Seems uh... there's no sound. Uh, by the way, since this this session, I'm just gonna show the some code. Um, I wonder, do you guys have any questions before I go into that? Because I can control the time relatively flexibly. Hi there. Hello, my name is Victor. Uh, I would like yeah, uh, to ask about performance. Uh, okay. You showed some numbers, but uh, what uh, about other bodies, rigid? Uh, how far away is it from real time? For example, if we uh, use simple rigid bodies like spheres or some convexes, and how far is from real time, for example, if we use Banyo? Right. Um, so it was real time about a decade ago, and now it's, it's a lot faster. Um, so you can, the thing is you can time step modes for an individual object in real time. And so the bottleneck is just how long it takes you to evaluate the transfer. If you are only doing, uh, you know, say tens of flops per mode to evaluate uh, a, tr a transfer function on average, then you can evaluate this, uh, you know, hundreds of times a second. Um, like in 2006 on a Pentium, you know, 4 chip, right? So um, you're, you're going to be able to do tens or hundreds of objects very easily, okay? And your main bottleneck is going to be dealing with all the physics and the contact interactions for tricky scenarios. Um, so in practice, it's highly parallel. So the physics becomes the, the bottleneck for a lot of applications. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I've heard for um, 
if you're doing frequency analysis and additive synthesis, which this is completely different than this, right? I've heard if you go that route, if you subtract that generated sound from the thing you were anal analyzing, you're left with kind of a filtered noise that's like the real world. Um, and I was curious, when generating sounds this way, d is it also missing that kind of real, real world filtered noise? Or is it, is it pretty good compared to reality? Um, so I think one of the challenges, so, so if you apply like a perfect impulse to an object, you get this damped sinusoid. Uh, and then this is an amplitude filter to that. So the things that are missing there are the complexity in the contact uh, interaction. So objects scrape along or they have more complicated uh, Im impacts. They're not perfect delta functions or even just like half sine pulses of force like Hertz contact. So there's complexity in the contact model, which adds a lot. There's complexity in the short time transient, which is not modeled in the wave equation here, which can add things. Um, and there's also interactions between the objects in terms of scattering, which is also important. Um, but I think, you know, the, the model's pretty good for, for very stiff objects, but in practice, objects aren't, you know, really that idealized in, in scenarios, so. All right, so um, I guess I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the, the code. The code is online, so you can download. Uh, the code is serving for the more like educational purpose, so I didn't spend too much time honestly to optimize, you know, using some uh, like GPU or computing or whatever. So it's not for, it's not performance optimized, it's more like um, uh, um, um, for educational purpose. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, in the next 12 minutes to, um, basically go through the pipeline. Um, obviously there are so many details that I cannot um, dive into, but I'm just gonna you know, show you guys uh, different steps. Um, you can download the code and, uh, and compile the code and after that, um, so for example, the first step you need to do is to generate the tetrahedral mesh. And of course there are many tools like TetGen of, um, that is available online to help you to uh, generate the tetrahedral mesh from the triangle mesh. Um, and I also have this one, uh, it's called ISO Stuffer, which implements this paper. So once you, uh, yeah. So then you can um, run this uh, code and node your tri uh, triangle mesh. For example, here I'm gonna node a bunny here. All right, so this is a, Lovely Stanford bunny, um, and then you can run the. Uh, I have the user interface, so you can just click this button and generate the um, the tetrahedral mesh. And of and of course, you can see the bunny is a little bit rough, and uh, you can also here um, increase the resolution. Um, so by the way, the algorithm I implement has this very nice property that can. Um, adaptively change the, the tetrahedral size. So for example, for this, tri the, this bunny, um, inside of the bunny, the tetrahedral is gonna become larger and larger. So you're gonna end up with smaller um, number of tetrahedrons. And you can control this adaptability to basically control the compromise or trade-offs between the accuracy and the, um, the, 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 the cost because Obviously, if you use too large tetrahedrons, you're gonna have um, relatively bad accuracy. So now I cranked up the resolution and then I run this again. So you can see the bunny becomes um, better, right? Um, so this is a tetrahedral mesh and then what, after that, you can save this tetrahedral mesh uh, into a file and then um, and then once you have this, we have another tool to help you to generate the stiffness and mass matrices that I just talked about. Um, so here's this, this, uh, oops, yeah, here's this, uh, this uh, command line tool. So just a very quick example, you can, um, you can go to this, uh, You can, 
So here you can see that you need to specify the tetrahedral file and you need to specify the Young's modulus um, using the minus Y option and the Poisson ratio. That's the where the mature property really kicks in. Right? You need to specify the mature properties to um, to control, for example, the vibrational frequencies. For example, you want to make the sound sound more like a metal, then you probably need a relatively large Young's modulus. Um, you can look up online. Um, the, all those young, these two parameters, the Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, they are physical parameters. So you pretty much, you know, you can start um, by looking looking up online and uh, and look at the, the specific material values and plug that here and use this tool to generate the mass and stiffness matrices and store that into a file. And after that, we um, uh, there's a there's a uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run run it here. If there's a uh, manap manap script, then you know you can use the manaps uh, eigen generalize the eigenvalue decomposition to compute the eigen modes. So basically, to do the linear model analysis uh, and store that into a file. And and uh, I also have this um, uh, very small tools. Uh, it's a visualizer. Um, so once you have that pre-computed. So for example, um, uh, so you can note the tetrahedral mesh. So this is a tetrahedral mesh, tetrahedronized bunny. Um, so you can see the resolution is relatively high. And then you can also see some, oops, uh, I guess the, um, and you can also see some of the statistics information. Um, but more importantly, I guess, um, I have this um, this interesting uh, visualization of the vibration modes. So, for example, I can come in here to load the um, vibration modes. This is the output from the generalized eigenvalue decomposition. And once I load that in, I can start to visualize the the vibration modes. So let me turn off the. So this is the first mode and the second mode and the third mode. Let me use another example which is better. Um, so let me turn off this guy. Oops, sorry. Um, so this time I'm going to load a dinner plate because the dinner plate is, um, I guess, dog just show as dog just showed. It's a symmetric object, and so it has some beautiful vibration patterns, which is easier to visualize um, in, than a bunny. So here's the dinner plate. Now I'm going to note the I, um, the vibration mode that I pre-computed already for you. Um, oh, sorry, I should note a dinner plate rather than a bunny. So here we go, and now I can visualize the dinner plate, and uh, so um, so you can see this is the f the, the the mode, uh, first mode, vibration mode, and this is the second one. And you can see the first one and the second one is similar. Just the, the pattern is just uh, rotated a little bit, rotated by 90 degrees. In fact, this is because the dinner plate has this symmetry, so the, uh, not surprisingly, the vibration modes also have these symmetries. And, but as you go to higher and higher mode, um, you, you're going to see different vibrational pattern here. Um, all right. Okay, so that's the, um, the part for the vibrational modes. Um, and then uh, we we move on to the um, to the to compute the the the, um, the transfer values. Um, for that, I because um, the computing the transfer value is uh, the pretty time consuming part. So I'm, I'm not going to show you a live demo, but we pr I pre compute the uh, transfer value and uh, uh, followed what Doug just talked about to generate um, the fast the multiple 
coefficients, to pre-compute the multiple coefficients, and store that into files. Um, and if you download the, um, if you download the, uh, the code, um, we also provide in the code if you compile that su su successfully. Um, I, I mean, I test the compilation on both Mac and, uh, and Linux. Uh, I, I, I'm testing um, on Windows, but uh, uh, I guess at this point I, I cannot fully guarantee it can compile successfully on, on Windows, but it should be. Anyway, once you compile that, uh, we also provide this Python binding, so you can, you know, use the Python code to, to write some script. So here, for example, is a simple, um, very simple Python script that you can node the vibration modes, and then you can query the, 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 the uh, uh, eigen modes and query some, uh, some, some vibration uh, modal frequencies. And also you can node the pre-compute the um, transfer values and start to evaluate the, the acoustic transfer value using your Python, um, Python code. So for example, here's a very simple example. I already, uh, I think I already node a, the, the vibration mode of the bunny. And then and it shows nodes uh, this 194 eigen modes and I can start to query the frequency value. Um, so here the input pa parameter, the, this one is the first mode. Um, it's a zero based index, so, so it's the first mode is zero. And then this is the um, density value. Um, by the way, there's, this, there's a, a little bit of details that I guess it's worth highlighting. So when we compute the, when we do the eigenvalue analysis, when we compute the mass and the, and the stiffness matrices and do the eigenvalue analysis, um, very often in practice, we treat the density value as the unit value, okay? This sounds a little bit strange, but the benefit of that is, is because um, mathematically you can see that the vibration pattern or vibration modes or the U matrix is independent from the um, density value, but the vibration frequency is inversely proportional to the frequency value. That means you can always, when you do the eigenvalue analysis, the generalized eigenvalue analysis, you can always treat the density value as a unit, and then afterwards you can plug in whatever density value and do this sort of like a uniform scanning to get the values. So that's why here, when I pre-compute the, the generalized eigenvalue, uh, when I query the frequency values, I need to pre, um, provide a specific density values. All right, that's the Python part. And then the, um, finally, we can put everything together. Um, so I um, created this very simple demo code. So you can look at the code and see how we put everything together. Um, so yes, here we go. Um, so here's a very simple dinner plate. Okay, so I know the eigenvalue uh, analysis, I know the transfer value, and now I can do the real-time uh, rigid body sound synthesis. So I can click here, right? And then, because this is real-time and everything is considered, so now if I move a little bit closer, so you can hear the sound is larger. And also, if I, yeah, it's too loud. <laughs> Um, and now, uh, the, if you click at different location, and then if I click here, for example, the sound is different, right? Um, so here, so basically, this is to, just to, by the way, answer the the, the, the question, the previous question. We uh, this is a demonstration to showing that um, we um, we are able to already to do the uh, rigid body, uh, real time sound synthesis for rigid bodies. And, but of course, for more complex sound phenomena, uh, it's still pretty pretty uh, expensive at this point. I guess I'm uh, pretty much on time, so that's great. Um, so yeah, feel free to download the code, and uh, if you have any questions about using the code, um, I think I put a readme, and also I, I, I detailed all the, the all the steps, all the required libraries. It does. It should. Requ it requires only like pretty standard library like Boost and Eigen's. I'm purposely when I when I was doing this, I'm purposely avoiding using some specific libraries. So yeah, give it a try. Good luck.
So welcome to today's course on um, physically based sound. Um, so this course is going to take a, a closer look at how to actually produce sound for computer animation with a, a strong emphasis on sound source modeling uh, for physically based animation. And the presenters are myself, Doug James, uh, Chansi Zhang from Columbia, Ting La Tim Langwa, who graduated just recently from Cornell and is now at Adobe Research, and Ravish Mera from Oculus Research. So Ravish is going to talk more about the sound propagation part, and we're going to talk more about the sound modeling part initially. Uh, so there's a long course description which says that basically there's a lot of stuff to do to actually produce sound for physically based animation. There's a lot of details. This course is going to try to explain it. So I don't have to tell people here at SIGGRAPH that physically based animation is widespread, it's common, uh, but in order to produce sound for these things, you need to go farther than just uh, computing uh, the visuals. Uh, in, in, in a sense, a lot of what we've done in the last few decades in computer graphics has been to reproduce Edison's legacy, which is to say that we have created fantastic tools for producing visual content, and, and all of the sound is an afterthought that comes later, right? So, and what's going to happen next, as motivated by VR and faster computers, is to actually put everything together so that now in the future we're going to be able to, you know, produce all of the animations, but the animations will have super high detail in time, capturing vibrations and radiation of the associated sound. So that in the future you're going to be able to compute an integrated audiovisual experience for display on whatever whatever device or platform that you want. And then finally, once we can resolve these sound sources, we can put them into uh, oralization engines and reverb engines of the future and then listen to those with your head-related transfer function or some other uh, you know, listening uh, model of the future. So our main focus here initially in the first part of the course is going to be on how do we model different types of physics-based animation sound sources and how do we model the radiation or acoustic transfer that comes out of them. Okay, so we've had a number of papers on this in the past, and there's increasing numbers of papers on this in, in, that are appearing. Um, so the, the course basically breaks these down into core. It, so this is a bit small. I'm going to I'm going to switch to this view. Uh, so the basic breakdown of the course is as follows. So in the first half before the break. Uh, we're going to look at vibrations. So we're going to look at modal vibration of rigid bodies, and then we're going to look at how those periodic harmonic vibrations produce radiation, uh, which we're going to call acoustic transfer. And we're going to look at a lot of different models for that in detail. Uh, and then to wrap it up, uh, this modal sound part, Chauncey is going to talk about how to implement rigid body sound. He's going to like write some code and generate some sound and talk about the, the code that's in GitHub to do that so that everybody can get started right away. We're going to have a short break and then we're going to talk about a bunch of different sound models. Acceleration noise, uh, brittle fracture, thin shells. Uh, Tim's going to spend some time talking about liquids and sort of an implementation details of the, the uh, advanced water sound paper that he just presented earlier this morning. We'll talk about fire and then Ravish is going to wrap up talking about issues with sound propagation and, and listening uh, for, for, for these in virtual environments. And that's basically the course. So it's a lot of stuff and we need to stay on schedule. I, hopefully I'm not too far behind. And five I'm five hours late. Oh, dude. Yeah, no, this is, I don't know why I thought it was in the morning. This is, yeah, just add five to everything, right? So there's some, you know, basic arithmetic required to do this stuff. Okay. Uh, also, oh, I, I need to say that uh, everything, where is my mouse pointer? Right here. Okay, everything is on the website or will be shortly. So we have slides. Uh, there's course notes for modal vibration and acoustic transfer in, in a lot more detail. And there's also code and, and different demos. Um, I'm going to put all the keynote presentations up there after I, when I get a better uh, internet connection a little bit later. But there's PDFs of all the slides that you can get there now. Okay. Do you want to go?
right. Um, thanks for the introduction, Doc. So, uh, sorry, I need to open the slides. Um, so, I guess the this beginning part is going to be have uh, it's a like a twenty minutes sesh, session right, to um, talk about the very basic um, mathematics about the modal vibration, and then from there we can talk about the transfer and also how to implement that. So for this part is we position that this more or less like a undergrad course. So I'm going to start with some very basic stuff. All right. Um, um, so <clears throat> firstly, um, for whatever acoustic phenomenon, you can, you know, it's directly related to vibration. So I guess a good starting point is to look at the, um, the one dimensional vibration. So in this simplest possible case is a spring connected to a mass. Um, so this is the mass, uh, so the spring force, if you consider the linear, linear case, is going to be the um, um, spring, sp spring coefficient k times the, uh, the displacement x. And also, of course, you have the inertial force. So this is the equation. And, uh, equation, and you can solve this equation Analytically, um, so here I'm using this uh, com complex number representation to represent or to express the vibration of this equation. And I guess, as most of you know, this essentially is the sinusoidal os uh, oscillator. And this uh, complex number is to use to represent not only the position but also the phase, not only the the amplitude but also the phase. Um, so now you can you know you can substitute this. Um, this expression a times the exponential of i omega t into this equation, and then um, this this um, double dots, which is the second order time derivative, um, is going to give you this omega square if you you substitute that into this ex expression, and then you can get an expression of the omega, which is the so-called natural vibration frequency of this one-dimensional system. And of course, this A, capital A, depends on the, um, the initial, in, initial condition. So for example, if, the, uh, if initially this x is 0, then, um, then you have to have uh, some constant value at A. So you can using the initial condition to, cons to compute this A value here. A slightly more complex case is um, you add this dumper which is used to model the energy dissipation during the uh, vibration process. Um, so this um, dumper essentially produces this dumping force proportional to the um, velocity and try to kill the velocity. So here D is the dumping coefficient. Now the question is how do we solve this, right? Especially when there's a force on the right-hand side to drive the vibration. That's very often the the, the, the real, in, what, what happened in reality, right? For example, later on, you're gonna see that in a rigid body simulation, um, on the right-hand side, the force comes from the context, right? When you're simulating the rigid body, the, the object bouncing around, every time it has a context, there's, there's, a, there's a contact force. And those force will appear on the right-hand side um, as a external force to drive the vibration. So now the question is, once you have this kind of, uh, uh, you know, arbitrary kind of um, external force, how do you solve this dumped one-dimensional vibration equation? So we start um, um, from a, simp uh, a, a derivation for the analytic analytical um, solution of this kind of uh, um, ordinary differential equation, and now talk, move on to talk about how to solve that numerically. Um, in order to solve this equation analytically, um, so we started from considering this so-called impulse response. Um, so the physical in interpretation is pretty simple. So basically suppose um, on the right-hand side you have just the impulse, okay? Um, and then what's gonna happen for this uh, dump vibrator? So um, instead of having a f on the right-hand side, you have a um, direct delta function on the right-hand side. And uh, the solution, the solution of this kind of, um, uh, this equation with the delta function on the right-hand side is called uh, the impulse response of this vibrator. 
And once you have this uh, impulse response, the advantage of that is analytically, um, then given a arbitrary um, force function f on the, on the right hand side, you can use start to use the time convolution to um, to construct the analytic expression of the solution with the arbitrary f function on the right hand side. So the question boils down how to, uh, boils down to how to solve or how to construct this impulse response. There are many different kind of um, different kind of uh, mathematical way of deriving this. So here, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to sketch a very simple um, derivation by using the, um, the so-called Laplace transform. Uh, Laplace transform is very much similar, if you know that, is very much similar to the Fourier transform. Um, so it transforms the arbitrary function here, f, into a function in the so-called s domain by using this integral. And one nice thing of this Laplace equation, uh, Laplace transform, is um, you know the the time derivative, um, the the Laplace transform of the time derivative of a function has this kind of very nice form. Um, so um, and also by the way the um, the direct delta function, and uh, um, the Laplace transform of that function becomes simply one. So now you can apply this um, Laplace transform on both sides, right? On both sides of this uh, um, this uh, uh, vibration equation with the direct delta function, and uh, here's what you get, right? Um, by the way, here I assume in my start, um, the vibrator start at the, with the displacement zero, and also start with the zero velocity. So everything is at the rest at the beginning, and then. I just apply this impulse to drive the vibration. So in that case, this f0 zero is 0, and uh, also the f prime 0 is also uh, uh, the 0 here, because the velocity is 0. And so you, 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 you arrive at this uh, very simple algebraic equation. And uh, the solution of this um, very simple algebraic equation looks like, um, like this. Right? It's essentially, it's 1 over this ms squared plus ds plus k. Right, and then this expression essentially is the Laplace transformed version of the impulse response, and uh, then of course you can apply this inverse Laplace transform to get the the inverse. Uh, sorry, to get the impulse response, and it looks like this in the middle. Um, I just want to mention that here, this omega here uh, is the square root of k over m, which is once again, the natural vibration of frequency. And, but there's some other uh, sort of concepts that we will, we will use later. This psi is, the, is, the, uh, is essentially the, um, the dumping coefficients, deciding, uh, which decides how, how quickly the vibration dumps. And then there's the omega d, which is the dumped vibration frequency. And you can see that it's omega times this uh, square root of this expression. And you can also see that immediately, if this psi is larger than one, and then this omega d becomes um, becomes you know the imaginary number, right? So that basically means if this psi, the dumping value is too large, then you won't be able to get any vibration. And if the psi is only when the psi is small enough, smaller than one, then you can have some vibration. So there is, though, by the way, in, in dynamic system, this is called a, a bifurcation phenomenon. So basically, when the psi equals one, there's a bifurcation appears. Um, when psi becomes larger than one, you basically have an overdumped system, meaning there won't be any vibration. And when psi is smaller than one, you're going to have this vibration. So for the purpose of sound synthesis, we are um, we are very often um, we are interested in the case where the psi is smaller than one. That means we are going to have some vibration, which in turn produces the audible sounds. All right, so that's the uh, the first part, and then um, we can have the um, that's the analytical part, and then numerically um, there, are, there are there are many different methods to to solve this. Uh, um, to numerically integrate this uh, vibration equation. And so here, um, you know, you can use the e explicit Euler or implicit Euler or Rankuta. 
Um, but I, here I just want to highlight one very simple approach, which is um, use this so-called digital IIR filter. So this is essentially is a filter um, 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 in the signal processing. And you can use this, this formula to numerically integrate the equation. Now, once we have this one-dimensional uh, vibrational equation in place, we can look at how to um, simulate the elastic vibration. Well, the elastic, the, the elastic vibration of a solid body um, is going to be essentially is a vector version of this 1D vibration equation. It's going to be look like this, very simple. Um, so here, instead of you know, this M, D, and K are, uh, instead of being uh, scanners, here this M is the mass matrix, and D is the dumping matrix, and K is the stiffness matrix, and this U is the non-vector. And by the way, this, um, all the matrix, matrices are here are, you know, are relatively large, depending on the degrees of freedoms, um, you know, in the volumetric mesh that is used to to um, discretize the, the, the object. Um, so I guess, um, so here for the sake of time, I'm just gonna briefly go through the um, mathematical process um, to give you guys a sense how to construct this uh, symmetric, the symmetric and the sparse matrix K. And, and, and then we can, from, from there, we can start to solve this equation. Well, in order to construct the A matrix, uh, sorry, the K matrix, the stiffness matrix, um, we look at a single tetrahedron, right? So in a t single tetrahedron, it has four nodes, and we know that um, when the four nodes deforms, you can construct this is so-called the deformation gradient. Um, so here this uh, capital X to capital X1, capital X2, capital X3, and 4, they are, they are undeformed position of the tetrahedron nodes. And this little x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are the, you know, the, respectively the deformed position of the nodes. And so, uh, you know, the, the, um, the elastic simulation, and people know that you can use this to construct the so called deformation gradient. And then use the deformation grid, you can measure how much the tetrahedron deforms, which is, by the way, called the strain tensor. And the strain tensor essentially is the nonlinear measure of how much a unit or infinitesimal length changes in the body. But you can linearize that, and that gives you this um, linearized version of the strain tensor. And from there, you can construct the stress, which is the internal force of the body. Um, from the material science, you know that the, um, the stress, the internal force, um, depends on the C. The C basically is the material dependent, um, in this linearized version, is a material de dependent force order tensor. So it's more like, uh, you know, it has one, it's, it has four dimensions. So that's why I, um, so it has like the A, B, I, J, and, and the four numbers as the, subs, as the index. Um, so now, uh, uh, by the way, the, the, this C, C, C matrix, the tensor, um, of course, depends on the, um, the mature properties. So for example, for isotropic and homogeneous mature, um, Based on the um, material constitutive law, you have this simple e expression. So here, this k is the um, a k and mu are both material properties, which you can look up online uh, in you know whatever mature data book, data book. And this delta is the so-called Kronecker um, delta. Um, so the, I guess the short story here, the key point here is um, once you have this. Then the stress tensor basically gave, uh, gives you the way to calculate the force, right? So um, if I have, a, for example, if I have a, a, a direction, then I can ask what is the force, the internal force produced along that direction, which essentially is the uh, stress tensor multiplied with uh, this direction. So um, now coming back to this tetrahedron, you can ask for every single node, what is the internal force you know, applied uh, or generated on that node by this tetrahedron? 
And the way to do this is you calculate the stress tensor using the way I just talked about, and then you uh, also calculate a effective normal direction for that node, and then you use S times N, that gives you the, the, the force F. Um, so by the way, the, the, the effective normal direction N is, one way you can calculate that is you can calculate that as the averaged normal direction of the three triangles adjacent to that nodes. Um, the key point here is that you can see that this F, this force is linearly uh, related to the displacement vector U, and that's why you can write this force as a um, linear form, F equals K times U, and that you, if you follow this process carefully and formally, that is the way you can construct the stiffness matrix. Um, and once you have the, the, the stiffness matrix, um, by the way, uh, here I'm just trying to uh, go through the mathematical part, and later on I will show you a, uh, the demo uh, with the code. The code is online, so you can download the code and you can see the exact uh, numerical routine, how we construct the k-matrix and the mass matrix and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so now um, come back here, so we also need to construct the, the dumping matrix, right? So very often, um, people use this so-called really dumping, which is the linear combination of the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix. One thing to highlight is just that this dumping matrix is a, just an empirical model, okay? There's no um, strict physical principle underneath that, and this is just the one that people has been used uh, widely used and it provides some numeric advantages which uh, we will see in a moment. And uh, oh, and uh, this alpha and the beta are two scanners which very often require some manual tuning. Um, so now we have this uh, matrix, right? We have, oh, sorry, we have this M, uh, these three matrices and the question is how do we solve this system of um, second order ordinary differential equation? Um, a typical, a standard way to do this is to using, um, uh, using the so-called linear model analysis. So in the linear model analysis, we begin, begin that by, um, by doing this so-called generalized eigenvalue analysis. So here, M and K are both known from the previous construction. So the generalized eigenvalue decomposition is going to give you a U matrix, which is called a modal shape um, matrix, and also this S matrix, which is a diagonal matrix, tells, um, uh, tells you some information about the vibration frequencies that you're gonna see in a moment. Um, one very nice algebraic property, well, actually two properties here, are, you know, if you have this U matrix, then U transpose times M times U gives you the identity matrix, and also U transpose times K times U gives you this diagonal S matrix. The advantage of this is once you have this uh, computed, then you can do a substitution of variables or, or change of variables. Um, so for example, if you um, express this vector U, the displacement vector U, as a um, a linear combination of the base, uh, shape vibration basis matrix U, uh, capital U here. Um, so, so then you can substitute this U times Q into this vibrational equation and pre-multiply the U transpose on both sides. So the equation should still hold, right? But the advantage of this is that Remember, the generalized eigenvalue um, decomposition has these two algebraic properties. So the first term, this U transpose times M times U, gives you identity matrix. And the third term, is U transpose times K times U, gives you this diagonal matrix. And of course, the middle term, um, if we are using this linear combination of K and, uh, and M as the dumping matrix, which is the so-called uh, really dumping. Uh, the, so the middle term is also diagonalized. Okay, that's what I mean by numerical advantage of using dump, uh, really dumping. So the advantage here, once we arrive here, you can see that um, even though we begin with a system of uh, second order 
um, vibration, uh, ordinary differential equations, what we arrive is a system of independent uh, decoupled equations, right? So here, um, so um, finally we hear what we have is like an independent um, one-dimensional vibrational equation because everything here is um, like the S is a diagonal matrix, so they are fully decoupled. So that means we can solve the, each of this independent uh, vibrational equation uh, indi individually and in parallel using the, um, in, you know, the one-dimensional numeric solver that I just talked about. And finally, I just want to quickly go through the pipeline, right? Um, so the pipeline begin with the triangle mesh, and then the first job you need to do is to generate the volumetric mesh. And then once you have that, you construct the stiffness and the mass matrices. And then with that, you use your generalized eigen decomposition, which, uh, you know, ManApp or some other numeric solver provides this functionality to do that. And uh, after that, you um, apply these change of variables to decouple the modal vibration equation into individual equations, and then you numerically integrate individual modes, and that's the way you can construct the, um, or you can compute or simulate the surface, linearize the surface vibration of the solid object. I'm gonna show you a demo in a moment, but I guess right now I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to Doug for the second part. Let's get started. So this is the second half of the class. Uh, lots of topics, mostly 15 minute vignettes, except for liquids, we're gonna spend more time on that. Okay, so the, the next topic is acceleration noise. And oh, let me get my sound plugged in here. Um, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so Acceleration noise is a way to improve uh, rigid body sound, modal sound models uh, even further. Uh, the reference for this is two papers, uh, one at SIGGRAPH 2015 and SCA paper. This is work with uh, one of my former students, Jeff Chadwick, who's a PhD student at Cornell. Uh, he did a lot of great work. Okay, so the motivation for acceleration noise is that something's missing with rigid body sound. So here's an example of a bunch of dice thrown on a uh, a wooden table. Let me just turn this up a little bit more. Can you turn it up a little bit? Or maybe it is. Okay, so let's break this sound down. So this is a, you take the modal sound pipeline, you process all the objects, get modal sound models and transfer models, and then render it, this is what you get. Um, so the problem is that Modal sound only gives you sound from object vibration, and that's not the only source of sound. Uh, it doesn't, in fact, include any sound from rigid body acceleration. So this is the sound you're hearing just from the table, okay? Uh, and if you listen to just the dice, this is the sound that comes out of the sound engine. So clearly, uh, you know, this is a problem. And so pre-computed acceleration noise was a technique for getting all of these little clicks that are missing from rigid body sound. So you get something more like this. Okay, so what's going on? Why are we missing things? So the sound pipeline we had so far only includes vibrations, but these objects, these tiny dice, their, start, their lowest frequency is already above 40 kilohertz, right? So you're not gonna hear anything from these uh, at, at regular audio rates. So all of the sound from them is coming from little clicks that aren't based on modal vibration at all, okay? So if we go back and look at our wave equation, we had a boundary condition, which is how the, the vibrations produce sound, right? So this is the normal derivative of the pressure, and uh, basically it's driven by the, the normal acceleration of the surface. But the normal acceleration of the surface isn't just from vibrations, it's also due to rapid rigid body impacts when an object hits the ground or hits another object, right? So there's a very short time scale during which the object changes direction, and that's gonna produce a huge acceleration, potentially. Um, so what we wanna do is capture both modal, modal sound as well as acceleration noise due to these rapid rigid body accelerations. Uh, so here's an old experiment people did to sort of get a handle on acceleration noise. They took two steel hammers, uh, shown here, and on these uh, swinging uh, 
uh, beams, and then they lifted them up and then dropped them and let them hit each other. So this is an awful room. This is like a sound torture chamber where you send people. And uh, inside, here's the sound that they recorded. There was a huge spike in pressure up to like 10 newtons per meter squared. So this is a loud sound. And followed by a ringing sound. So this is the ringing sound of the hammers themselves, the ding when the hammers hit. And this part here is the acceleration noise, basically a loud click, where you basically hear the derivative of the acceleration profile applied to the objects. And so this thing is, is, is really important because if you're, for small objects, it's the only source of sound, okay? Okay, so basically what we wanna do is capture the sound produced by these rapid accelerations that can be on the order of, uh, you know, tens of, of microseconds in duration, tens to hundreds of microseconds, depending on the stiffness of the object. And when you accelerate objects rapidly, like during impacts, then they can produce these sounds that are not due to modal sound, but are entirely due to just the wave phenomena from that impulse. Uh, so here's an object that's accelerated briefly from the left. And in this case, it causes the object to accelerate the surface uh, fluid uh, around the object and cause this echo inside this little bowl. And so even though the object has no modal vibration, it produces sort of pseudo harmonic vibration response just due to the echo uh, resonance of the, of the bowl chamber. Um, the problem with this is that even though the impulse uh, is only milliseconds long, you know, time stepping this on the CPU takes on the order of seven minutes per millisecond for, for four milliseconds of sound, right? So this is pretty slow. And, and not going to be practical to render, you know, real real animations. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to pre-compute these clicks and play them back in a principled way. So what we can do is we can realize that this acceleration field is basically uh, driven only by six parameters. Um, so if we look at the rigid body, it has some center of mass. It has some linear translational acceleration that gets applied, a three-vector. It also has a three vector for the angular acceleration uh, on, the, uh, on the rigid body. And so these six numbers basically contribute to this surface acceleration field, A sub n. So you can think of this, this field as being a, a, a sum of six, six, uh, six fields, where each one is linearly scaled by each of the acceleration uh, numbers, the linear acceleration and angular acceleration. So if we just look at the, one of the components, say the first component, this is the, say the X component of the linear acceleration in time, and, and in space it's just the X component of the normal, the normal vector. And each, each of these fields has a, its own decomposition, but I'm just gonna consider just one of them. So they have a, 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 a time and space separation of variables that you can exploit. Okay, so if we just look at the first one, what we can do is we can just think about a little short time impulse, a little basis function like this one that gets used to parameterize the time dependence of this acceleration profile. And, and so we can use this then to solve a, a, a wave equation for that pulse. And then later what we can do, if we have an arbitrary acceleration profile due to some impact uh, scenario, we can then approximate this by a whole bunch of these little basis functions. And since we know we can pre-compute the response of this little acceleration pulse to figure out what the resulting sound is. And then at runtime, we can just basically do a convolution where we take the acceleration profile weighted combination here uh, and then use that to, uh, to generate the sound. So for every little imp impulse applied, we're gonna play a little impulse related sound. And so we do that together in linear superposition and get all of, the, all of the resulting waveforms that we add up in the time domain. So this is the basic idea. So we pre-compute these clicks due to impulses and then at runtime we use all the rigid body simulators impulses to give us the right resulting sound. And so we can go ahead and pre-compute these click responses for the accelerations in X, Y, and Z and angular accelerations in X, Y, and Z and get these sound fields that we record in the outgoing direction. So we don't wanna to have to store the whole 3D space-time volume of all of the sound, because that would just be way too much data. Even though it's a short amount of time, it's still, it's still every point in space has its own waveform. So in practice, we can encode it more efficiently using an outgoing uh, model of the sound. So along any outgoing ray, 
we can build a simplified model of the sound and then just sample a bunch of ray directions. Um, so what we did was we basically uh, came up with a model which is based on a 1 over R expansion where each, each factor multiplying the 1 over R expansion was a little waveform and it's just uh, shifted in time depending on how far away from the object you are. And this is an attenuation model. So this is, is a, a least squares approach to modeling the outgoing sound, which can work quite well. And so what we do is we take the object, we apply this, this short pulse boundary condition to it, and then we simulate the response. And then along any outgoing ray, we listen to the sound at, at a bunch of locations and then fit our model parameters uh, so that they, f they match that. And this can be done using least squares, and I won't go into the details, but it works quite well. And so we do this along a bunch of outgoing rays. You can pick how many rays you want, uh, depending on what your storage or accuracy requirements are. And then at runtime, when you want to render, uh, when an object hits something, uh, you simply figure out where the listener's position is, and then find the nearest ray and basically do the convolution to play that little click that you need for that direction. Um, so the question, next question is then what acceleration really occurs? If you're time stepping your rigid body at some rate, say 500 hertz or something, you can't resolve short time collisions. And in practice we have, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of microseconds durations for these elastic collisions which are really, really crucial to resolve in order to actually get the right profile in time. Because you basically hear clicks which tell you the mass and, and stiffness properties and size of, of objects. And so we want to be able to resolve that. So a simple model of Hertz contact uh, basically was proposed for spheres and contact. And basically there's a force profile that's related to a you know, half sine pulse of some time scale. And there's a model for the time scale for, for this simple case, which is that basically you have a formula like this, which you can plug in the model parameters for each of your objects. If there's spheres, the radii of the spheres, the, the masses and the material parameters, the sh stiffness and Poisson ratio. And you put these together, you can get an estimate of the, of the, of the time scales. And this will allow you to actually uh, analytically basically determine uh, how long each of these contacts should take. And this gives you the acceleration profile of the objects, and then you can use that to, to determine um, basically the, the sound that needs to be played. And the, there's more details in the paper and on, on the website. Okay, so using this approach then, we can, we can go ahead and pre-compute these pulses, or these clicks of the outgoing sound and, and get the acceleration models. Uh, for our rigid body simulator. So here's a bunch of comparisons without acceleration noise and with only acceleration noise and then together and then a comparison in some cases. So here's ball bearings. These ball bearings have no modal sound at all. So if you put a whole bunch of marbles together or ball bearings together in a modal sound engine, you get no sound, which is clearly wrong. So this is a, these, are, these tiny objects are the cases where acceleration noise is critical. These coins have a significant acceleration noise, especially when they're spinning and rolling or spooling around. And then some other examples we did, in order to avoid pre-computation for lots of pieces, we came up with some approaches to uh, have databases of small primitives. We build sound models for them and then use those to rapidly generate the sound. Uh, we have a sound bank of different types of primitives. And Chauncey's gonna talk more about this kind of idea when he, we talk about the fracture paper. And we also have some techniques to compress the waveforms to allow us to speed up both uh, the pre-comp as well as to do faster synthesis. So in this way you can handle lots of objects if you want to smash things into millions of pieces. It's not going to cause a pre-comp problem.
And so for a fracture, it's actually really important because you've got lots of tiny debris, and a lot of those pieces wouldn't previously make sound because we didn't have acceleration noise. This is my favorite example. Just going to play it over and over again. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about with that. So the next part is, is about brittle fracture. I'll pass it over to Chauncey. I'm going to pull out the audio now. All right, so, um, so in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, another sound phenomenon, um, about brittle, fra uh, brittle fracture. So I guess first thing, the high level philosophy here is uh, where we, we are trying to address different sound phenomena one by one and uh, to enrich you know, the, the tool set of sound synthesis. And then later on, we can start to look at how to, you know, improve the performance or how to put them together into a multi-physics engine. But this is just one uh, one component to address one of the specific sound phenomena. All right. So um, the goal is, as I said, to synthesize the brittle fracture, um, which is obviously a very um, frequent sound phenomena um, that we encountered in the daily life. Um, so here's a typical example that we um, we managed to simulate. Um, all right. So um, how how do we do this? Okay. So we start by doing some physical ex experiments um, by you know dropping some um, some of some of these uh, ceramic tiles. So here are some some footage. Okay. So those are simple example, um, but it's very instructive um, in the sense that um, um, if, you know if you look at this footage, um, you're going to see that. Um, so here on the top is the footage. On the bottom is the sound spectrogram, um, which basically shows as time goes how the sound frequency component distributes. Uh, at each of the um, in a time instant, um, I just want to highlight at this point, you know, where this fracture occurs, and you can see that the sound spectrogram changes suddenly, and uh, and um, um, so this, there's a instantaneous spectrum change. So what does that mean? So that means um, the the brittle fracture occurs very at, during a very short amount of time, and you can almost ignore the transient, transient behavior um, during the, the fracture process. So this links back to the rigid body sound model that, that basically shows that we can probably we can use the rigid body sound model to also synthesize the brittle fractures. Um, and noise. So here, um, that means we, the, you know, in terms of the pipeline, we, we have two major steps. The first step is we need some physics simulation uh, simulator to simulate the fracture process, um, to generate the debris, and also to estimate the force that 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 is the external force appearing on the right hand side of the vibration equation. Remember, record that that I, I talked about at the beginning. Um, so once you have those two comp uh, those information, and then you can s we can simply use the uh, rigid body um, sound model that um, um, we talked about in the first half of this course to synthesize the final sound. So it sounds pretty simple, um, but the key question then is um, how do you um, gen com calculate the force, the the fracture um, force to to drive the sound? So here's a simple uh, rigid body simulation. Whenever two objects collide each other, and obviously there's a force. Um, so the force 
is going to um, deform the object a little bit, even though very often for solid objects it's very tiny. Um, but this deformation exists, and if this kind of deformation is too large, and uh, of course the object breaks, right? Um, but the key thing is, in addition to generate the fractured pattern, we which is you know related to the visual parts, visual component, we also need to calculate the force. Uh, in this particular case, it's called fracture impulses. That is used to um, to drive the the modal vibration, and that is the way to generate sound waves. So um, we, if you look at the pipeline, then we basically have um, four kind of steps. Um, in the first two step, um, we have to constantly perform them to detect when the collision occurs. So whenever an object is is in in collision, so we have to. Um, we have to do these first two steps to ask whether this collision force is too large um, so the object starts to break, right? Um, and this is the pretty expensive because we have to um, do this kind of things at the audio rate, so that's why this step has to be, be fast. So our first uh, kind of contribution is to make this um, fracture simulation um, as fast as possible. So how do we do this? Well, um, if you look at the fracture, essentially uh, it boils down to this quasi-static stress analysis, which is a good approximation of the, for the uh, broad uh, brittle fracture. So in quasi-static stress analysis, the answer is a very simple question. It's given an external force, what is the quasi-static deformation of the object under that external force. Um, so this K is the stiffness matrix that I, I talked about. So once you have this K and you have the external force which comes from the, the, the collisions, um, then you need to solve this, this very simple linear system. It's quasi-static, so the uh, inertial part is, is ignored to solve this, um, this to solve for the, the displacement U. And notice that this K, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's pretty large, it's sparse, and also is rank efficient. The reason it's rank efficient is because, as you can probably, you can, you can imagine, if this U vector contains some rigid body motion, right? Whenever a solid object is experiencing some solid, uh, rigid body motion, um, there's no deformation at all, right? So you shouldn't generate any internal force. So that means there exists in some kind of displacement vector U um, which produces the rigid body motion such that there's no internal force. That also means this K matrix has some um, dual space or some rank deficiencies. Um, so this is a rank deficient system, so we can only solve that in a um, least residual sense. Or, um, um, so we have this kind of way to solve this, this system very easily. Um, so here the high level idea essentially is we need to find, we construct a matrix V here. What this matrix V does is to sort of transform the system such that I can use a change of variable again um, to use this V times R to represent the U vector. But the benefit of that is I can use this V matrix to sort of project out the lower space. And so uh, after constructing this V matrix, this V transpose times K times V gives you a full rank matrix. And such that, so that you can, you can easily um, uh, solve this system. Um, right, so the next step is once we um, detect there, there needs to be some fracture, then how do we break it break the fracture, and also how do we compute the most uh, important component, uh, which is the fracture impulses in order to generate the sound. Um, in order to, to that end, we, um, we propose this model uh, based on this, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the physical principle, which is the uh, energy conservation. So if you think about the fracture process, okay, um, when there's an external force applied on the object, the object starts to deform, right? 
In other words, this object starts to store some internal, store some strain energy, because um, the, the, the external force is going to do some work on the uh, object. And then suddenly the object starts to break, right? Um, when the object breaks, if you think about that at the molecular level, uh, essentially the molecular bonds start to break, and that consumes some energy. So that's why this, this strain energy is uh, one part of the strain energy is going to be released as the fracture energy. That's the energy consumed by um, breaking the object into debris. And the remaining part is going to be released as the change of kinetic energy um, or the change of velocity. Uh, so that's the, that, that is the way to release, uh, to produce the fracture impulse. So here this is the case. In this case, the object breaks into two parts. Um, so on the fractured surface, there will be some kind of fracture impulses generated. And then our goal is to calculate that kind of fracture impulses and use that, infraction, use that impulses to drive the rigid body sound model. Well, so the way we calculate that is to, um, to look at how much the kinetic energy changes, right? So here, if I have a um, fracture impulses, the fracture Im uh, impulses is going to produce some force and also some torque. And both the force and the torque is, uh, you know, can be plugged into the Newton's second law to change the um, um, linear velocity and the rotational velocity here. And uh, of course, with this change, you can uh, write down the expression of how much the kinetic energy changes um, under this kind of fracture impulses. Uh, one thing I want to mention is here's this tau here in the middle. Um, that is the, the sort of time duration of the fracture impulse. So basically, it's effectively how long the, the, the force is going to be applied on the object in order to change the velocity or angular velocity of the object. And that effective time duration is unknown, but we can use the energy um, conservation law to calculate this, um, this um, time duration, um, because if you Remember here, uh, we know the total strain energy, we know the fracture energy, and from that we know how much the kinetic energy is going to change. So after we came here, um, sorry, after we came here, um, this becomes the equation. And on the, the left hand side, we have the energy change. On the right hand side, we have the, exp uh, the expression with, res with respect to tau, so we can calculate tau and that gives us the fracture impulses. That's one of the key contribution of this work. And with that, we can, um, we can uh, you know, uh, synthesize some sound, right? And here's a comparison. Um, the compare the fracture sound with the real experiment. So I'm gonna show the real recording first, and then they synthesize the sound. And once again, So you can you can you can hear that even though the camera position and the the, the material parameters are 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 kind of different from the real case, but hopefully the um, the uh, the sound is quantitatively very uh, similar to the real case. Um, so the last piece is to improve the performance, right? Um, so one thing we notice is that if you look at the um, the performance um, breakdown. Um, you see that the model analysis and the transfer computation is um, is kind of expensive because um, there are so many debris generated, and for every single debris, you have to run the run the model analysis, the linear model analysis, and you have to compute the transfer values, so which which are very very expensive. So one way to improve uh, to improve the performance is to exploit the perceptual ambiguity. Um, so here, the, the key observation here is that um, whenever you have a large number of debris, you can replace some of the debris um, into a slightly simpler shapes, and then use that simplified shape to produce sound. And because there are so many, uh, so many debris, so um, this kind of uh, simplification won't be uh, noticed. 
So um, along that line of thinking, so we start to create a database where in the database um, you have um, a bunch of sim sim very simple primitive shapes. Uh, here we use in, uh, simply the ellipsoids. And for each in the ellipsoids, we can pre-compute all the vibration frequencies, eigenmodes, and the transfer values, um, uh, co uh, the multiple coefficients for the transfer values, and so on and so forth. And then at runtime, whenever I have a debris, I can simply replace this debris by a simpler shape. So here's the, um, here's the uh, uh, visualization. So here's the, um, the glass slab breaking on the ground. And then I can replace this into the ellipsoids. And there's a, uh, there's a very subtle, deta uh, the subtle details, which is how to sample this primitive shape space, right? Um, so we exploit the fact that there is a, whenever you linearly scale the object, the, um, all the quantities, like the vibration frequencies and the vibration modes and even the, the uh, transfer coefficients, they all scale, um, uh, they all have this kind of scaling relationship. So that means we, can, we only need to um, sample the ellipsoid shapes that is normalized. So in this particular case, we normalize that such that these A, B, and C parameters that de describe the shapes of the ellipsoids um, as a unit uh, square sum. So it's just a one way to normalize that, and here's the way to visualize um, this sample space. In any case, uh, we can f um, generate s the, the sound using the sound, the sound banks. So here um, I'm going to show you four different kinds of sounds. The first one is the original one without any sound bank replacement. And the next three one is the ones with increment, uh, in progressively more and more replacement. Right, and hopefully you can, you can hear that, well, you can, you can agree that they are very much similar. And here's another case. And with that, the, the advantage here is with this kind of replacement, you really don't need to, you know, um, recompute the transfers because you can keep reusing the ones from the database, which is much, much, much faster. Um, I guess that ends the session for the uh, brittle fracture. Um, I guess I, I'm going to pass over to to Doc um, to talk about shells. All right. All right. Moving right along here. Uh, so now we're on to thin shells. Then Tim is going to talk about liquids. So thin shells are a little more involved, and I, I'm only going to spend uh, 10 minutes on, on thin shells because I could go into more detail, and I, I don't want to take it away from other stuff. Um, so this was a project that basically is a culmination of two things. One, a project harmonic shells uh, led by Jeff Chadwick and Stephen Ahn. And then a, a method for model reduction based on optimizing cubature, which was published at SIGGRAPH Asia in 2008, which allowed us to do really fast subspace integration. And so the basic reason why this is interesting for, for sound modeling is that thin shells are really noisy. Uh, they, they make a, a grungy, noisy sound, and they don't ring like modal objects with a pure dinging kind of sound. So here's an example. So the garbage can has a crunchy kind of sound. And, and the real reason shells are noisy is because of chaos. There's a crazy amount of coupling between the, the modal vibrations of, of this structure. Even though the, the, the visible amount of deformation may be very small, there's still nonlinear coupling present because the shells uh, don't like to stretch or shear but they bend very easily. So as they start to bend, then they start to distort, and that causes the stretching forces and shearing forces to couple the modes together. So 
here shown on the, on the bottom is what you get when you take a, a symbol modeled with a, a, a linear modal model in gray. And when you excite it, it starts to ring with a damped sinusoidal uh, behavior. But when you allow the, the, the nonlinear forces to be modeled correctly, or better, then you start to see modes coupling and exchanging energy, and their their behavior is more chaotic and less predictable because energy is shifting from between modes, and this makes it sound very very different. You can still see they're they're mostly they have a strong uh, frequency component localized, but it still has a lower frequency fluctuations. And when you look at the frequency response of the models, they're very different in the linear case versus the nonlinear case. So you can still see individual modes have a clear frequency response in the linear model, but now in the nonlinear case, there's coupling between them, and so a given mode will have coupling to lower frequency components. And this gives it this noisy, grungy sound. Um, so how can we model this? Well, uh, without going into a whole lot of details, we can come up with a, an energy model for uh, a shell model based on uh, how much... A, how much stretching of the membrane occurs. So in blue, we basically have a triangle. We can think of how much that stretches or shears. And there's some energy term which will penalize that. The other energy term has to do with bending. And this can be modeled by an edge flap model. Uh, we have two triangles connected by an edge. And how much that edge bends can produce some energy. So there's models for this. And we use a model that came out of uh, Columbia many years ago. Um, and then. So now that we have an energy model, you can think of this as just a, a, a sum over the surface of some energy density. And the energy density depends on the displacements of the vertices of this triangle mesh. Uh, and it also depends on where on the mesh you evaluate it. At the end of the day, you can think of this as just a sum over all of the triangles in the mesh where each triangle contributes some energy. Here it depends on this triangle as well as the edge flaps, which we need for bending. Um, so at runtime, then, every time you want to take a time step, you're going to have to integrate over the whole object to get this energy. The other problem is that once you actually figure out how the object deforms, now how do you generate the sound pressure? So it's a small deformation. Its, it's shape is well approximated by the modal, uh, linear modal model. So we can transform back to the linear modal model space to get modal coordinates and then use acoustic transfer to get a sound. So we still have to time step the shell and then we have to get back to modal coordinates to use transfer, which is, which is a further pain. So it would be really great if we could just time step the whole thing in terms of modal coordinates and cup, capture the nonlinear force coupling modes together. So we can do this if we try to think of this, this internal force, which is a gradient of some energy, and try to evaluate this more quickly in terms of modal coordinates instead of the vertex displacements. So that's the basic idea. Okay, so let's have a little dynamics interlude where we talk about how to do subspace integration more efficiently. So this is a topic called dimensional model reduction. And ba the basic idea is we have our equations of motion that we've talked about for uh, linear modal analysis. But now, in this case, the internal forces are nonlinear. There's, there's more terms that we have to account for. Uh, and so how are we going to do this? Um, so we can do the same thing we did before. We can compute the linear modes for the system, and that gives us a transformation from vertex displacements to modal displacements in some low-dimensional subspace. And we can project this into the subspace like before. Uh, this, this mass matrix can be diagonalized using suitable normalization of the modes, mass normalized modes. And we end up with a system like this. So for a small number of modes, we have, an, say, M modes. We have an M vector here of accelerations, and we have a small M vector of modal forces for the internal shell response. The problem is this is very nonlinear, and then there's some external forces due to impact and so on. So it's a simple equation, but the, 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 the mess is all hidden in this term. Um, so recall in linear modal analysis, uh, this force... Uh, is simple because the eigenmode uh, matrix effectively diagonalizes all of the l simple harmonic oscillators, and it, the ith force only the ith mode force only depends on the ith modal coordinate. So this is super simple, and you can time step this with the infinite impulse response IAR filters and very fast and without any any dissipation. So this is very good. Uh, in the general case, when you have a general nonlinear system. 
the internal forces are messy and everything doesn't simplify. So what you have to do is you have to first, given a modal coordinate for the shape you're in, you have to evaluate all of the vertex displacements by doing this UQ multiply. Once you get the vertex positions, you evaluate the internal forces of each element, and then you accumulate all those element forces together to get vertex forces, and then you project it all back into the subspace to get the modal force. So this is the process you always have to do, and this is, involves all of the degrees of freedom of the system, which is slow. So you have to take the modes, deform, accumulate, and gather back. So this is slow, and really you want to go directly there. And so there's a way to do this called optimizing cubature, which I, I don't have time to explain, but the basic idea is you do this integral uh, as a sum of things, but now you only sum over a subset of elements. So you take all your geometry and modes and you find some locations to evaluate this at with some magic weights, W, which allow you to do the integral much more quickly. Um, and the end result is that now for the shell, we basically uh, take our equations of motion in the subspace and the internal forces are now only a sum over a subset of elements, these magic cubature elements, instead of a sum over all triangles. So instead of doing using all triangles, we just use a subset, and this makes it uh, faster in practice. Um, and the error goes down as you take more and more samples, and in practice, uh, you can get it so that it's reasonably good. So I, I will have to stay on track. So I'll show this video and then some results and then end there for this topic. So here's uh, with no air from cubature. This is just the subspace integration projecting and evaluating exactly. And then progressively more air adds progressively more sound effects, artifacts. So at some point you have some unconstrained degrees of freedom and it starts ringing oddly. Um, the nice thing about the using subspace integration even without cubature is that it gives, allows you to take a larger time step, uh, which is important because if you have to time step the model at, you know, like, you know, a fraction of a megahertz because of the time step restriction, this is a real problem. So you can take larger time steps and, and get, get faster. So this object was time stepped. And 19 days on a 16 core workstation to produce this five second clip using traditional explicit Newmark, which is insane. Uh, and on a laptop, this model took two, 2.8 hours. So in, in this case, the, there's some error in the base modes, but it's dramatically faster in this case. So some results, um, tens, of, tens of milliseconds per time step. I'm going to skip ahead here uh, and just show you a final comparison. So this one shows um, the effect of the nonlinear oscillator model with transfer to linear modal model with transfer. And then finally, a more popular model which ignores transfer and just use linear modes. I just wanted to switch to this example.
this example is what you get if you use physical parameters for all of that materials, the plastic and metals. And usually you would have to tune them to non-physical proper values to make them sound better. Uh, but with a physics-based model, you can just set all the parameters and just run it, and it works out of the box. Um, okay, so staying on track here. Next, uh, next up is liquids, and then we'll do fire and sound in VR. Okay, pulling the sound out. Uh, so I'm going to talk about liquid sounds. Okay, so let me start with a high-level illustration of how fluids make sound. Um, so it starts when bubbles undergo volume oscillations. This creates pressure waves um, which travel through the water, and these cause the water surface to vibrate. And then the vibrating water surface causes pressure waves in the air, which travel to our ears and we hear a sound. So it's important to note here that the acoustic water surface vibrations are much faster and smaller uh, than the visual motion that we see. So you can so sort of think of it as the fluid surface is acting like a loudspeaker uh, and it's slowly changing its shape over time. Um, so I'm going to talk about how fluid sound is modeled and simulated, some of the choices and trade-offs associated with simulating it, and some of the implementation challenges that at least I experienced during the project this year. Okay, so how exactly does water make sound? So like I just said, it comes mainly from bubbles, uh, but what surprises most people is that most of the sound is produced when bubbles form, not when they pop. So bubbles behave like a damped oscillator, and the frequency depends on the size, shape, and position of the bubble. So let me play an example bubble sound for you. So the video is going to play in slow motion, but the sound is going to play at regular speed. Okay, and then when we visualize uh, the sound that I just played, we can see that the waveform looks similar to a damped oscillator. And in the spectrogram on the bottom, you can clearly see that there's one main frequency uh, that shifts as the bubble approaches the surface. So in a moment, um, I'll talk about how we compute this frequency and different choices of how to compute it. So there's been three pr main projects on simulating fluid sound that have been presented at SIGGRAPH in the past. Harmonic fluids in 2009, sounding liquids in 2010, and toward animating water with complex acoustic bubbles, uh, presented earlier today, actually. Um, so they all make different modeling and simulation choices, which I'm going to discuss. But first, let me just play a sample result from each of them. So the high-level pipeline for simulating liquid sound generally looks something like this. So it starts with some sort of fluid simulation, and then somehow we determine frequencies for the bubbles, and then we compute radiation for the bubbles, which is basically just how loud each bubble is at the listening position, and then we synthesize the final sound. So one important thing to note is that um, theoretically it would be possible just to run a fully compressible simulation and actually time step the pressure waves. Um, but we usually use incompressible simulation for a couple of reasons, um, and we add these additional frequency and radiation models. So compressible simulation is incredibly computationally expensive, even more expensive than some of the stuff I did this morning. And also, almost all graphics fluid simulation assumes incompressibility, uh, so using a pipeline like this integrates much better with existing fluid simulators. So let me start with fluid simulation. So the largest decision is uh, of which fluid, fluid simulation method to use is whether to use a Lagrangian particle method uh, or, an, or a Larian method. So harmonic fluids uses uh, the FLIP method, which is a particle-based simulator. So a really big advantage of this is that bubbles are individual particles, so they're easy to identify and track between time steps. Um, however, create, creating the bubbles requires some modeling. So basically, they use a layer of marker particles near the fluid surface. And then when marker particles get pulled deep enough into the fluid, they can become bubble seeds, which can then emit bubbles. So models are needed to distribute with the sizes of each bubble that gets created. And also there's no interaction between bubbles, such as splitting or merging. Um, so there's no underwater sound events that can happen in this one. And the second major type um, is Eulerian or grid-based simulation. So one, one option that was used in the complex acoustic bubbles paper um, is volume of fluid simulation. So here we define a volume of fluid field that's zero in the air and one in the water, which is illustrated with the slice view here. So blue is air and red is water here. So other simulation variables such as density and viscosity are interpolated based on this field. And there's an advection equation for the VOF field itself. 
So this method has one big advantage, namely that bubble entrainment is handled accurately because we're actually simulating the water and the air together. However, bubble identification and tracking um, is a lot more involved here because now bubbles are just connected components in the grid of areas where the VOF value is less than one. Uh, the Sounding Liquid project uses two simulators, um, a level set simulator, which is another type of two-phase Eulerian simulation, and they add bubble particles to the simulator uh, to simulate really tiny bubbles that they can't resolve. And then they also use a shallow water simulation, which represents water as a height field, essentially reducing it to a 2D problem. Okay, so in grid-based simulation, bubble tracking needs to be addressed. In the VOF simulation, we identify bubbles using a flood fill method. So basically, the grid scanned for air cells, and when we find an air cell that hasn't been ID'd yet, all the other air cells that are reachable from it are flood filled with an ID. And then we keep doing this until all the bubbles get their own ID. So the picture in the corner here kind of illustrates this. There's two bubbles that are shown. Um, the first one's filled with an index of one, and then the second one gets an index two. And then we also need to track bubbles between time steps, which we do by advecting this index field with the flow. So then we can compare the previous um, advected indices from the previous time step with the newly assigned indices at the current time step. So there's a few possible cases. When there's no previous index, um, it's a newly entrained bubble. When there's no current index, the bubble disappeared or collapsed. If there's one previous index and one current index, uh, the bubble just moved, uh, we call that advection. And then if one previous index shows up in two places, it means the bubble split into two or more bubbles. And if two previous indices touch in the current time step, it means two bubbles merge together. And then, so one implementation issue that can pop up during bubble tracking is when events happen simultaneously during one time step. Um, for example, if there's a bubble near the water surface and in one time step, a new bubble gets entrained and merges with this current bubble. Uh, so this causes the volume of the bubble to change drastically, obviously. But if you're not careful, this can cause problems. So for example, in incompressible simulation, bubbles don't change volume. So you might only compute the volume when the bubble's formed, and then you only compute it when there's new events or something. Um, so if you don't catch these events, then you might not recalculate the volume, but then your frequency calculation might new use the new service, um, which happened. But um, <laughs> um, So you have to watch out for things like this. And another implementation issue that can pop up is resolution limits. So remember that in volume of fluid simulation, bubbles are identified as connected components of air cells, like the blue patches here. So that means we obviously can't resolve bubbles that are smaller than one grid cell. So for particle simulations, like in harmonic fluids, this isn't really an issue because each, each bubble is its own particle with its radius chosen from some distribution. Um, so the sounding liquids project and the complex acoustic bubbles projects handle these resolution limits in a couple different ways. In sounding liquids, they add bubble particles um, for really tiny bubbles that they can't resolve, and they actually couple them to the simulation so those particles move with the flow. In the complex acoustic bubbles project, we just add tiny bubbles only in the audio domain, um, so we sample their size and hence their frequency and play the bubble sounds, but the bubble motion is not actually simulated with the liquid. Okay, so now let me talk about uh, bubble frequencies. So the analogy used to model bubble vibrations is a spring, but here the internal gas and the surface tension at the bubble wall provide the restoring force, and the surrounding liquid that the bubble's moving is the mass. So a bubble's volume oscillations around the average volume behave like a damped oscillator, and the frequency is usually described in terms of a stiffness uh, term kappa and a mass term m. So almost a century ago, um, Minert derived the frequency of an isolated spherical bubble. So as you can see from the equation for the Minert frequency here, it really just depends on the radius of the bubble. The other terms in there are just physical parameters. Um, so this equation is actually pretty accurate if the bubble is far away from interfaces and it is spherical, but it obviously can't provide any complex frequency effects that happen when bubbles get near the, uh, the surface. So harmonic fluids and sounding liquids um, use the Minert frequency, and they both use an ad hoc formula to add a pitch rise effect to the sound. Harmonic fluids bases its formula on the distance of the bubble to the fluid surface, and sounding liquids bases it on the age of the bubble. So these are obviously just trivial to calculate, but they both require hand-tuned parameters, and they can't account for frequency effects from rigid container walls. They're just modeling the pitch rise effect that happens at fluid surfaces. Um, so in the complex acoustic bubbles project, uh, we presented a method to accurately compute a bubble's frequency, taking all those effects into account, 
Um, so we can calculate accurate frequencies, but it's a lot more computationally expensive, so there's a trade-off there. Um, so let me just quickly talk about how we model those frequencies. So again, to calculate the frequency, we need to calculate those stiffness and mass terms. The stiffness term is actually fairly straightforward, and it doesn't depend on the bubble shape or any interfaces, so we mainly care about the mass term. So to calculate that, uh, we, st we build upon the work of Strasbourg. So we started by calculating the kinetic energy of a bubble as one-half the mass times the volume velocity squared. So remember here that V is the volume of the bubble, so V dot is the rate of change that the volume is changing at. This isn't the velocity of the fluid. So the bubble is moving the fluid, so they have the same kinetic energy. Uh, so if we can calculate the kinetic energy of the fluid, we can get this mass term. So then we note that bubbles are acoustically compact sources. Um, so for example, if we look at a two millimeter diameter bubble, it generates sound at about 3.3 kilohertz. So if we draw these sound waves to scale, it's obvious that they're much bigger than the bubble. So this means that the fluid flow is well approximated by locally incompressible irrotational motion that can be modeled with the Laplace equation. And it also means that the pressure is almost constant on the bubble surface, which will be important in a bit. And so because the flow is well modeled as incompressible and irrotational, we can define the acoustic particle velocity as the gradient of a potential function phi, which satisfies the Laplace equation. And, um, and then the kinetic energy of the fluid can just be calculated using a volume integral of the acoustic particle velocity. And then using one of Green's identities, we can convert this volume integral into a surface integral outlined at the bottom. The volume integral on the right is zero due to incompressibility. Okay, so the problem can be visualized like this. We wanna solve for phi, which satisfies the Laplace equation in the fluid. At the rigid walls in white, the normal velocity is zero. At the fluid surface in red, the potential value is zero because this is a pressure release surface, so the acoustic pressure is zero there. And then on the bubble surface in yellow, we're gonna set the potential value to one, which I'll explain in a sec. So due to our boundary conditions, uh, we're just left with the integral over the bubble surface to compute the mass term. So remember here that the potential value is constant on the bubble surface, so we can pull that outside of the integral. And then noting that the volume velocity is the integral of the normal velocity over the surface, um, we arrive at this compact equation for the mass, which is actually pretty straightforward. It's just the density of the fluid times the potential value on the bubble surface, which we just set to one, divided by the volume velocity. Um, and again, the volume velocity is calculated as the surface integral of the normal velocity. And then there's this really neat analogy where if we treat the potential as electrostatic potential and the volume velocity as the flux, uh, we can define this bubble capacitance term C, which is mathematically equivalent to electrostatic capacitance. So the bubble is acting like a uniform potential conductor-like surface. Uh, the fluid surface has zero potential and the rigid walls have no flux. So this gives us a generalized frequency model, which accounts for the size, shape, and position of the bubble. So all we need to do is compute this C term, which only depends on the geometry of the interfaces. So this is nice because Strasberg originally used this to um, calculate it for simplified geometries. So he was able to use published capacitance values if you have an ellipsoid bubble or if a bubble gets near a, a, an infinite plane, there are published capacitance values for that. Um, so it was really beautiful. Um, so our model kind of uh, it reproduces and generalizes the classical frequency models of Minert and Strasberg. And so the, the effects of pitch rise can be really surprising. So for example, if we take a three millimeter bubble and move it around in an eight centimeter tank, the frequency can vary by over 700 hertz. So it's lower near the tank walls and it rises sharply near the water's surface, which is the cause of the familiar bloop effect of bubbles. And again, for a simulated rising bubble shown here with a cross section view, um, we can again see that sharp frequency rise um, here of about 72% as the thin lamella forms on the top of the bubble. Uh, so normalized frequency values here are shown in parentheses. And a bubble's shape also affects its frequency. So this bubble pulls itself back into a sphere from an ellipsoid shape, causing its frequency to drop by about 15% in just 13 milliseconds. Um, okay, so the next part of the pipeline is bubble radiation. So the, perp the goal here is to calculate how well the pressure from each bubble travels to our ears, which determines how loud each bubble is. So the simplest sound model would be to just sum all of the bubble vibrations together. In fact, um, this is what the Sounding Liquids project does, because radiation is, can be, is, well, it is really expensive to calculate. So while this has the right frequencies, um, it's difficult to produce high quality sound. 
So remember, the fluid acts kind of like a shape-changing loudspeaker that dis displays some frequencies better than others. So the sound's actually a weighted sum of the bubble vibrations, where the weights are transfer function values that we need to compute. So here, observe that um, fluid sound travels at nearly a kilometer and a half per second, which is much faster than the typical fluid motions. So uh, we end up approximating the sound pressure as a sequence of wave problems, each with a fixed fluid geometry. So then the sound pressure for each single frequency bubble satisfi satisfies the frequency domain wave equation, or the Hemholtz equation. So here, k is the wave number, which is discontinuous because it has different values in the fluid and the air. Um, and to get the bubble's transfer function for sound rendering, we just have to solve the Hemholtz equation at each time step for each bubble. And so calculating radiation is really important for high quality sound. So this plot shows the magnitude of those transfer functions for one of the examples from the harmonic fluids paper. So you can see that there are over 100x magnitude differences for some of the bubbles. Um, it's also, it's frequency dependent and it's spatially and temporally varying. Uh, okay, so in harmonic fluids, um, this fast dual domain solver was introduced. So because liquids like water are a thousand times heavier than air, fluid, vi fluid vibration is only weakly affected by the surrounding air. So the domains can be separated with one-way coupling. So first, they solve for the fluid domain to determine the harmonic fluid surface vibration due to the bubble's vibration. And then second, they treat the whole fluid geometry as a vibrating object and solve for the air domain radiation from the vibrating fluid surface. They use an equivalent source method, which is computationally efficient and integrates really well with their flip solver. In complex acoustic bubbles, um, we use a standard boundary element method to solve the exterior Hemholtz problem. The important thing to note here is that the fluid surface vibration boundary data comes from the interior frequency solve. So similar to harmonic fluids, we're treating the domain separately, solving the interior first um, and then the exterior. But here we're treating the fluid as incompressible. And we're also using a mesh-based boundary element solver instead of an equivalent source method. So I should note here that while this sequence of Hemholtz problems formulation helps a lot compared to having no transfer, there are still effects that it misses. So for example, here are two simultaneous waveforms um, from a recorded bubble, one recorded in the air and one recorded underwater with a hydrophone. So you can see the air, the air microphone has a lot more content and um, takes longer to die out because of all the reflections from the tank and the room that happen in the air. Okay, um, so one implementation issue is if you're gonna use a boundary element solver, um, you need to have a surface mesh, which can be tricky for several reasons. So algorithms like marching cubes can obviously generate meshes from volume data, um, but when there's external geometry here, you get these tricky T-junctions, which are difficult to mesh um, correctly. Um, so to get around this, that, that's part of the reason why we mesh the interior and the exterior problems separately, and then we interpolate the boundary conditions between the two domains. And another implementation issue with meshing that's important when you're going to use the mesh for boundary element solves is um, the number of triangles and the mesh quality. So the BEM generates dense system matrices, so it can become really incredibly slow when you have too many triangles. Um, so we adaptively simplify the meshes um, with a few important caveats. So bubbles need to be, res be resolved when they get close to the interfaces. So here we ensure that all triangles are smaller than the distance to the nearest bubble from the triangle. So in the image here, you can see um, that as uh, bubbles um, get close to the surface, that's where you get those really small triangles to resolve them. Um, and you also need to watch out for badly scaled triangles. So these can ruin the accuracy of the solution. And another thing is that there's resolution constraints to be aware of. Um, so we need to be able to resolve the solution. So this is really important for Hemholtz solves, which have oscillatory solutions. Um, the rule of thumb is usually that you need about six triangles per wavelength um, of whatever frequency you're solving. And I'm sorry, I forgot to advance the slide there, but that's everything I just said. <laughs> um, okay, and the final part is synthesizing the sound. So this part's pretty simple. It basically just involves integrating the bubble oscillations and weighting them with transfer functions. So again, we have the standard damped uh, harmonic oscillator equation for each bubble. The important thing to note here is that the frequency and the damping coefficients are time varying. So we actually need to numerically integrate this equation. Uh, we can't just use an IIR, IIR filter that we can for the modes. Um, but the integration is really easy, like the midpoint method or any Runge-Kuda method works just fine. 
And one implementation challenge um, is what you do with oscill um, the oscillators during bubble events. So for example, if there's two bubbles and they're both in the middle of oscillating uh, and they merge, how do you merge those oscillations together? So if you simply stopped the two bubbles and then started a new oscillator for the new bubble, there'd be some discontinuity in the sound that would cause a noticeable click. Um, so what, what we ended up doing in complex acoustic bubbles was we continued the larger bubbles oscillation into the newer one and just had its mass coefficient and frequency change basically. And we just let the smaller bubble damp out, they damp out really quickly. Um, for splitting events, uh, the oscillation continues to the largest daughter bubble, and then the smaller daughter bubble starts a new oscillator. Okay, so let me just, um, so let me end with uh, my favorite fact about this project, um, <laughs> which is this loosely related but really kind of beautiful fact. So if you've ever gone on a whale watch, um, you might have seen whales doing what's called bubble net hunting. So basically a pod of whales will work together and they blow this giant spiral of bubbles underwater, which is really big. This is like 30 meters in diameter here. And then the whales surface in the center of the spiral and they eat a bunch of fish, um, which is great. And people have known they do this for a while, but the question for a while has been, why do the fish stay in the center of these bubbles? Because there's bubbles all over the ocean, fish make bubbles, you know, so fish are not scared of bubbles. And um, the answer is that the whales, after they make the bubbles, they yell at the bubbles, basically. Whales make these really loud sounds underwater. So now this big spiral of bubbles is vibrating and it's generates, generating sound. And the shape of the spiral acts almost like a waveguide, so the waves stay in this spiral for a while. So now this is really loud wall of sound. And in addition to that, um, fish have this internal organ called a swim bladder, which is basically this little air pocket they use to control their buoyancy. So now in addition, all these sound waves are actually vibrating all of the fishes, or some of the fish's internal organs, um, which probably gives them a terrible stomach ache, I don't know. But um, that's one of the ways that whales hunt, which I found really great. Um, Okay, and one last thing I'd like to show you is we have this interactive Python demo, which I can't type right now. Okay. Um, so this, for a spherical bubble, this will use the infinite plane. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, let me just mirror it. That'll be easier. Okay. Um, so this, for a spherical bubble, this is using the infinite plane capacitance um, equation to compute um, basically the frequency. Um, so you can kind of change the radius of the bubble and its depth interactively, and you can see, so as the bubble gets deeper, um, it gets a lot closer to the Bernoulli frequency. I can zoom out and get it even closer. Um, so the capacitance value kind of reproduces that Bernoulli frequency. Um, but as the bubble gets close to the surface, you can see the frequency stays almost, it increases slowly, and then once you get very close to the surface, let me zoom in here, um, you can see this is where that bloop sound is from. It increases really quickly there. And this isn't even increasing all the way, so the, the infinite plane can only increase the frequency by about a factor of 1.5. Um, in practice, as that fluid morphs around the bubble, you get frequency increases of 2 to 3. Um, so the local fluid geometry is actually really important for the frequency calculation. And then also, if you change it to um, a rigid surface, um, now you can see that the frequency decreases as the bubble gets closer to the surface. And it again happens really quickly. Um, you know, as the bubble gets further away, it gets closer again to the Minert frequency. Um, so this is on the website. You're welcome to play with it. Um, you can save out wave, wave files of the bubbles. Um, so... <laughs> um, so it might be something fun to play with or show your friends. Uh, all right, everybody, that's all I got. Thanks. Great. Well, we're getting getting there. Um, so next up is fire, and then then we have sound and VR. So these are the last two sections. So this is 15 minutes. Um, okay. So fire sounds. This.
came from a paper um, called Animating Fire with Sound. It was a project that Jeff Chadwick worked on for his thesis. Um, so fire is really common in graphics and there's many different types of solvers which are used to produce various visual effects um, of you know, varying degrees of physical realism. Um, so it's really easy to generate fire. Here's a really simple uh, fire simulation, a little, a little block of fuel burning in, in a Houdini fire solver. So how can we generate sound for this? Uh, to what extent can we do this in a physically based way at all? Um, so sound synthesis for aerodynamic sounds has been around for a while. So work by um, Dobashi and Nishida and others um, looked at how to do vortex-based sound. So this is, this is sound which is driven by whistling phenomena. Whenever you create turbulence fast enough, the vortices are spinning fast enough, then the presence of nearby structures can amplify these types of sounds. And even without nearby structures, you can still get turbulent wind-like sounds. Um, and they, they use these to, sorry, I should say that they use these uh, to produce sort of uh, sounds for swords and whatnot, as well as to, to produce sounds for fire and things like that. Although it's not actually the, the main source of, of fire sound. Here's a preview. of The kind of effect that we can get with our simulator. Um, so just as background, there's a, much, a bunch of different source terms for sound for combustion. Um, one source is aerodynamic sound or vortex-based sound that Dabashi modeled. The main source is so-called direct combustion noise, and that has to do with the density changes, the rapid expansion of gas due to changes in heat release rate. And, uh, and so these are, are really important. There's also other more complicated things due to advection if you have like supersonic flows through jet engines and things like that, but we're looking at really simple uh, low speed flows. So the simplest model you can get is basically the wave equation driven by a source term uh, which has to do with the rate of change of Q, where Q is basically the combustion heat release rate. So if the heat release rate in some region is constant, such as if you have a candle which is not flickering, it's just steady, there's no sound. Uh, but if there's change in, in the heat release rate and thus change in the amount of volume increase of the, of the fluid, then you can get fluctuations which produce sound. So when you blow on a candle, you're going to get some fluctuations which produce noise. Um, so this is a, a really simple model. Um, if you think of this as a compact uh, source, so like it's a, in a small region, um, then you can think of this as a, a basically a monopole source term, and we can convert it to an integral over the total amount of source and integrate uh, this, this uh, heat release rate divided by R and think of that as the total sound. Um, so basically the, the model that we have for the sound is that it's the rate of change of the total heat release rate in, the, in, the, in that region. So this is something that we could potentially compute. Um, but it's tricky because uh, a lot of the flame solvers that are used in graphics lack a lot of detail. They don't accurately predict heat release rates of combustion because they don't have to. And they don't model even, a lot of them don't even model chemistry of combustion, which is very complicated. So when I talk to like a world expert on like how to model the acoustics of combustion, uh, he said, well, this is a well understood problem. Here's like some supercomputer codes that you can run that will be able to model these chemical reactions and you can get all these heat release rates and it'll only take you a month on the supercomputer to get like a second of sound or something. You know, so, so it's like a solved problem, but completely not useful for computer graphics. So how can we model these sounds even if we don't model the, 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 the chemistry? And if you look at uh, here's here's uh, you know my wife shaking around a, a burning object uh, you know in the dark. Then you can see all these rapid fluctuations in the fire uh, that are happening even at one tenth speed. And so we don't even model these sub these sub time step kind of uh, fluctuations, let alone the heat release variations. Uh, so this is sort of a a problem that we could solve in principle, but we don't really want to solve in practice. So these are the kind of sounds that we'd like to be able to simulate. If you look at the, the spectrogram for this, the spectrum, then you basically see uh, you have this characteristic sort of power law kind of behavior where you have this wide range of frequencies where the, the sound has this roughly power law-like shape. 
Um, but it's not just a steady wall of noise with this spectrum, right? There's interesting fluctuations that we'd like to capture. Um, so the problem is, in principle, you could, you could simulate this, but it would be very expensive. And we don't even time step combustion simulations and graphics beyond like a few hundred hertz in practice. So there's no way in which we can actually recover this high frequency information. Um, and even if we did time step it at those rates, the simulators that we're using in graphics don't actually have that much uh, information or chemistry in them anyway. So what, what should we do? So what our approach was was to basically come up with a low frequency uh, sound model and then use that sound model to drive a texture synthesis or some sort of bandwidth extension method to add more high frequency detail to it. So let me talk about the low frequency sound model first. So the basic idea is we're going to simulate uh, a, a combustion process at some band limited rate and use that to make a low frequency sound. Um, so we already came up with this notion that sound is essentially the rate of change of the total heat release rate of, of some region. And what we can try to do is try to model the heat release rate using quantities that are familiar to us in, in graphics, uh, try to approximate that. So there's different types of, of models of heat release rate and it depends on what kind of uh, combustion process you're modeling. So one, one type is a so-called pre-mixed flame assumption where you basically have the reactants uh, are all mixed prior to combustion, say the, the fuel and the, and the oxygen, and then there's an ignition which rapidly consumes, uh, it consumes the, the you know, reactants and, and, uh, and then they you know, immediately combust and release their heat. So in these kind of models, you often have a flame front uh, that's modeled and everything that passes through, the, through this flame front then rapidly combusts and release their, their, their energy. So the rate at which things flow through the flame, flame front then tells you the rate at which heat release is, uh, occurs. Uh, so in this model, you can basically model some, some flame front here where you have unburnt fuel inside and then uh, everything that flows through this is basically uh, something that you can try to model just with the velocity field and densities. Uh, so in this particular case, we model the sound with some isosurface and then essentially the heat release rate volume integral can be converted to a surface integral for this premixed uh, fuel assumption case. Okay, so... This is, this is something that actually people do in combustion acoustics. They model the heat release with velocity flux. So the, the Q is basically the flux of the fuel going through the front scaled by some constant. And so we can just model this velocity flux through the, the isosurface and then take its, integrate that and take a derivative. And this is basically what we do. So in the Houdini solver, we basically computed these fluxes and then output that. Um, so there's different ways you could do this in practice, but basically, I'm going to skip that slide. At the end of the day, what we have is this integral of the flux on the surface, and then we can take a time derivative of that. So in practice, what we do is we just output these flux integrals uh, from the solver, and, and that basically becomes a signal which we can then upsample with a smooth Mitchell Natural Valley filter, and then take a time derivative of that smooth function, and that becomes the sound signal. And so that's what a Houdini solver sounds like in this particular case. So you can see that it's totally band limited, right? So if we turn up the resolution in time, we would get more information, but it wouldn't necessarily sound like the fire we wanted because we're not modeling the physics of the combustion and all the vortices and mixing and reactions properly. So the approach that we take is then to use this basically as a scaffold to hold all the extra temporal details that we model using data. So that will allow us to give us, it'll give us control over the type of sound because we can use different types of recordings and it will allow us to um, get a more uh, controllable, directable style. Um, so that's what we do. Basically we use uh, low frequency sound as a guide and then add detail on, on it using texture synthesis. So this is a method that's widely used in images and also in sound texture synthesis. There's different methods that are becoming um, increasingly more used. So the basic idea of texture synthesis, which probably everybody's seen now at SIGGRAPH, is, uh, you know, goes way back. You take an input texture, you can recursively downsample it, 
and then use that to build a database of features at different scales which look at their local neighborhoods and then use the local nearest neighbors uh, uh, that have similar appearances to help synthesize the next sample in your image. And this is basically the same kind of idea where we take in a recorded sound uh, that has the type of details that we're interested in, and then we build a 1D Gaussian pyramid by recursively blurring and downsampling the signal, and then get features at different scales which tell us how, how to synthesize next, the next finer scale. And so basically we start off with some crummy low frequency sound that we've generated from our simulator, and then we can recursively synthesize the next finer scale using these texture synthesis ideas. And uh, uh, I think I'll probably, I can, I'll just say at the current time we basically look at the previous uh, samples at that, at that scale as well as nearby s samples at the coarser scale and use that basically as a feature vector which we can then look up in our database with some appropriate uh, histogram matching to allow us to find uh, the sample at the next, uh, to add to the signal. And we basically do some shift overlap add to filter in that little change uh, to get the, the next sample. Okay, just to give some results. So here's a, a dragon example with now with detail added from a recording. And here's a candle blowing on a candle with some velocity field. And here's the burning brick. And this, this example illustrates the effect of changing the type of sound recording that you use as input for the synthesis approach. So here's three different recordings and three different results. This is just the training input. And this last one is uh, some insane liquid fire, the guy's like throwing oil into a bonfire or something. you can have some more control over the type of uh, flickering and intensity of the signal. So these are the kind of uh, simulations we ran. These were pretty low res simulations, so you can't really get that much out of them. And the sound te texture synthesis time was very cheap in comparison to the actual uh, Houdini solve time, which is, you know, not, not real time. But you could run this with a, a low resolution simulator, probably on a GPU, and do texture synthesis in real time. <laughs> 